Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We still have uh, other people streaming into the webinar, but we'll start, uh, start the program today. My name's Rob Laidlaw. I'm Executive Director of ZooCheck, one of the sponsoring organizations. I'd like to welcome you to, to this webinar series called Wild Among Us about exotic pets. And uh, on behalf of World Animal Protection and ZooCheck who are hosting this, uh, I wanted to say it's very uh, wonderful to have you participate. Um, the webinar series addresses uh, a number of exotic animal issues um, with regard to trade, regulation, seizure and sheltering of exotic animals kept as pets and the associated animal welfare, public health and safety and environmental risks that they may pose. Now, World Animal Protection and ZooCheck are both organizations working on exotic pet issues in Canada and in other parts of the world. World Animal Protection is a global charity whose mission is to move the world to protect animals. So using evidence-based research, World Animal Protection and exposes uh, uh, animal welfare issues and works collaboratively with a range of stakeholders to identify and to deliver positive sustainable change. World Animal Protection's vision is a world where animals live free from cruelty and suffering. ZooCheck is a Canadian-based international wildlife protection charity established in 1984 to promote and protect the interests and well-being of wild animals, both free roaming in nature and those held in captivity. We work with a broad range of collaborating partners, both in Canada and in other parts of the world, and ZooCheck endeavors to promote animal protection in specific situations and strives to bring about a new respect for all living things in the world in which they live. Part of our programming is this webinar series, which started last week. And the first segment of the webinar series provided uh, audience members with an overview of the exotic pet trade, a glimpse into what animal welfare is, and an interview with renowned ethologist and author Mark Beckoff. So it was uh, a great start to, to the program. This week's webinars titled Inspection and Assessment of Exotic Pets, Residential, Commercial and Institutional, explores some of the more practical aspects of animal housing and care and how to assess them. We have a great lineup of speakers, both in this webinar and there are subsequent webinars coming up in the coming weeks. Uh, and we wanted to let you know just before we get going that after the second session today, we will be taking a, a stretch break for about 10 minutes, but we'll be coming back for the third session by Dr. Neil Cruz. So let's uh, kick off the session with our first speaker. And that is Dr. Alex Wilson. She's a veterinarian and a medical director at the Center for Avian and Exotic Medicine in New York City. Uh, Dr. Wilson graduated from veterinary school in 2005 and has been working exclusively with exotic animals since 2007. Uh, as I said, she's the medical director of the Center for Avian and Exotic Medicine, where she cares for the medical and surgical needs of small mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians that are kept as pets. Uh, Dr. Wilson also serves as a consultant for the Animal Care Centers of New York City uh, and the Wild Bird Fund, New York City's premier wildlife rehabilitation and education center, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and local law enforcement refer exotic animal welfare cases to Dr. Wilson for evaluation and documentation of evidence. Uh, and as a national and international lecturer, Dr. Wilson trains veterinarians, veterinary nurses, and students on the care of exotic pets and wildlife. And she actually participated in some of uh, World Animal Protection and ZooCheck's previous sessions here in Canada aimed at educating enforcement personnel and policymakers. Uh, Dr. Wilson is also an adjunct professor at LaGuardia Community College's Veterinary Technology Program. Her presentation title is Welfare and Care of Exotic Animals in a Shelter Environment. And I'm sure it'll be a great learning experience, certainly for everyone who's watching and I expect for myself as well. So without any further ado, we will turn the screen over to Dr. Wilson and listen to what wonderful information she's going to pre present to us. 
Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, like Rob said, uh, I'm going to be speaking about the welfare and care of exotic animals in the shelter environment. And I'm hoping the information I cover today will be really useful for anyone who uh, is in a city shelter environment, perhaps private rescue groups or private shelters. Um, also for people who are inspecting shelters, inspecting pet stores, um, you know, collections of, of animals. Um, you know, so we're just going to cover basic husbandry, care, transport, uh, th things like that. And <clears throat> just, just a little bit more of my background, specifically uh, in shelter medicine, um, I work with New York City's uh, animal shelter system. So it's, a, it's quite a large uh, city funded uh, shelter. There's four or five different locations where uh, intake occurs and um, you know their policy is that you know they focus on dogs and cats like most shelters do that's really the only animals they can care for and house so the exotic pets that come through are essentially just there as a stopover uh, they do get assessed um, but again the medical team or the veterinarians the veterinary technicians they're they're really focused on dog and cat medicine so they're doing just general assessment and then those animals usually within 24 hours are getting transported off to uh, private rescue groups that more or less specialize in maybe different species like small mammals or reptiles um, and there's uh, really a loss of oversight, of course, when that happens. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what happens to those animals, um, but the city, New York City's policy is if someone cannot, can no longer take care of their animal, um, the shelter system has to take it in. They can't say no, they can't turn them away. Uh, I also work with um, various nonprofit rescue groups um, you know, run by private individuals. Again, a lot of those groups are species specific. Um, and we do work a lot with uh, rescue groups and then individuals who consider themselves as having a sanctuary. Um, so a lot of different capacity uh, of, of shelter type situations that I deal with on a, on a regular basis. <clears throat> so what are the, you know, what are exotic animals? Um, this is a term that uh, you know, a lot of people don't even really understand what, what, is, what is an exotic animal. In veterinary medicine, we've sort of given the, the very, you know, broad term of exotic animal uh, to uh, the animals listed on the slide. So small mammals like rabbits, ferrets, guinea pigs, and then our small rodents, uh, and birds and reptiles. So these are considered pets. Uh, They're not dogs and cats, so you could also say non-dog and cat pets. Uh, exotic animals generally are not farm or zoo animals. Those are in their own category as far as many shelters and rescue groups go, although you can imagine there's some overlap um, perhaps um, with both farm and zoo animals. Um, but again, we're mostly talking about privately owned pets. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind that most of these animals are prey species. Uh, they, it, you know, they are scared of dogs and cats. They are scared of humans, um, um, and because of that, the way we handle them is very different. Um, their behavior is very different. So I'm going to start with pet birds, and. Um, you know, what type of pet birds you might encounter in a, in a shelter or rescue environment is going to depend a lot on where you are. Are you in a large city? <clears throat> are you in the country? Um, many pet, you know, the majority of pet birds, I would say, are in the family of parrots or citizen birds. These are birds that have that hook-shaped, powerful beak, uh, and those are going to be ranging in size from little budgies and uh, or parakeets, people call them, all the way up to some larger macaws and cockatoos. Um, people also do keep doves and finches, um, it, I'm sorry, doves and pigeons, um, canaries and finches, uh, 
chickens, um, that obviously uh, is more for rural communities. Although I can tell you there has been of late a resurgence in people keeping backyard, so-called backyard chickens. Uh, so even in a more suburban environment, people may have a chicken coop in their backyard. Um, and then of course, ducks and geese. So again, talking more about um, pet, pet birds, um, like our parrots, finches, canaries, doves, uh, that sort of thing, not so much chickens and ducks, which are living outdoors. Um, when we're talking about transport, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that these birds are from uh, temperate climates. They are not native to Canada or the US. Um, they're from these tropical, subtropical, cl tr subtropical climates, and they, they're, they're not adapted to uh, the winter cold. Um, they are, need to be housed indoors. Um, so again, when you're transporting them, you need to keep that need for supplemental heat in mind. So you can wrap the carrier that they're in with blankets. Um, they also have uh, heating packs. Uh, you know, these some of them are microwavable. Some of them are more chemical in nature. You can activate them, um, even a hot water bottles. So um, you know, putting obviously you don't want to put these things where the animal can chew it and and potentially ingest. Uh, one of these things, um, but again, putting it around or near the carrier um, somewhere. Um, also, just if you're moving an animal, uh, a bird from a home or some sort of environment into a vehicle, uh, again, turn that vehicle on, get it nice and warm in there um, if it's winter time, um, and just move that bird very quickly into the heated vehicle. Um, so just keep that uh, in mind. Ideally, you want to transport pet birds in some pretty sturdy cage cages or carriers. Um, and the reason is, again, those uh, with the parrots, especially, they have those really powerful beaks and they can chew through just about anything. Uh, so again, a nice hard plastic uh, carrier. Again, these are the same ones that they market for dogs and cats. Um, they can be used for birds. Um, there are various types of metal you know, wire metal uh, carriers that, that will work for birds as well. Um, you can put a perch in there um, or not. Um, we definitely recommend you line the bottom of that carrier with some, you know, paper, or maybe an old towel because uh, birds tend to poop a lot and they will very quickly get their feet and their feathers very dirty if they're just standing right on the, the surface or the floor of the carrier. Um, I found this picture and I think it's a pretty good example, again, of how powerful these birds' beaks can be. So um, even that really hard, dense plastic, um, you get some of the larger parrots like cockatoos and macaws and they, if they're in there for long enough and they want out, um, they, will, they will make their way out of there. Um, so again, they, they definitely can chew through cardboard, um, mesh material, fabric carriers. Uh, again, so just don't risk it. If, if they're motivated, they will be out and, <laughs> um, and, and you'll be in trouble. So um, like that cardboard box with the towel in that bottom picture there, I can't tell you how many times uh, I see animals coming in. Uh, you know, it's like the owners got a pet and had a pet for years and years and never once thought that they would have to maybe transport it somewhere or take it to the vet. Um, so this is what they have. Um, and you know, it's not just the birds that can get themselves out of this. We'll talk about this a little bit again with rabbits and rodents, they're gonna chew out of a cardboard box as well. Um, people also have this, uh, this idea that you know, birds are, need to eat all the time. They, they need a constant source of food. Um, yeah, they do have high metabolisms compared to mammals, um, but again, they can go for an hour or two without food or water, okay? So um, don't feel like you have to provide food um, unless it's a really prolonged transport sort of situation. Um, so again, birds are, for the most part, uh, prey species. They are more likely to be scared of you. Um, of, uh, of course, there's some birds whose owners have socialized them um, and they may just 
you know, behave and step up and, and, and be with a stranger with no problem. Um, but if they're scared, um, if they're in a, a, a situation that they're not used to, they're, you know, their instinct is going to be to bite. So, um, you know, well, first it would be to try and get away. But again, if they're cornered in a cage um, where you're trying to catch them, corner them and catch them, um, their instinct is going to be to try and bite. And uh, again, depending on the size of the bird, um, you need to be careful about that. They can have some pretty severe bites, okay? This doesn't count so much for the chickens, the ducks. Um, they can bite, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt <laughs> quite as bad. Um, but same with uh, doves and pigeons and the small finches and canaries. So um, it's really just our citizen birds that can do this kind of damage. Um, so how do you hold or restrain or capture a bird um, without getting hurt yourself and without uh, hurting the bird. And again, um, like I mentioned, some birds have been very well trained um, by their owners. But uh, again, if they're if you're a, you're a stranger and maybe they're in a situation where their owner isn't there, uh, who knows? They're they're going to be very nervous. But some birds you can literally put your hand out um, and ask the bird to step up and they will step onto your, your hand or your arm um, and you can, you can move the bird that way. Uh, I would not really ever expect that to happen. I'd be prepared for sort of the opposite <laughs> to happen, um, but that, it, it, again, it's possible. Um, so our preferred uh, method for restraining birds is called the towel technique. And um, this is essentially where you use a, a cotton appropriately sized towel um, to sort of drape over the bird. Um, people think we're sort of strangling them by the neck, grabbing them around the neck. Um, we're not, our fingers are around the neck, but we're not squeezing. We're actually supporting the, the mandible or their lower jaw um, with our thumb and forefinger. Okay, and we're kind of keeping that bird's head from being able to twist and turn um, to reach down and perhaps bite us or twist out of our control. Um, they also like to have something to grab onto with their feet. So that could be your finger um, or it could be the towel if you wrap the bird completely in the towel. The towel also does keep their wings from uh, just flapping and, and keeps them from hurting themselves. So it keeps those wings sort of tucked in um, and it's just, it's just a good way to keep the bird safe. Um, anytime you are restraining an exotic animal, um, keep in mind that m most of these animals are not uh, touched and held very often. Uh, so you want to limit the time that you're actually having them in, a, in restraint. You'll see that, they, that their respiratory rate and respiratory effort will increase uh, hugely when they are being held uh, compared to when they're standing at rest. Um, we don't generally recommend nets, although sometimes you don't have a choice. Um, if a bird is well flighted and there's no way you're going to catch it, it's up high and you can't get to it, obviously you may need to use a net. Um, birds can get stuck in nets, their wings, their legs can get tangled in a net. Um, and then also a net, if you go to get a bird out of a net, you're not exactly protected either. Whereas with the towel technique, your hands and fingers are protected, they're covered by that towel. So if the bird does bite, um, they're going to bite more at the towel than your, than your fingers. Um, we also don't really like thick gloves. Uh, again, you'd have to have really thick gloves to prevent damage from a bite from a, a citizen or parrot uh, bird. So, um, it, you know, you're really not going to have a whole lot of dexterity. Uh, with gloves on and again you could hurt that bird and you might not be able to restrain it at all. Um, there are lots of there's lots of information about bird restraint using the towel technique. There's videos online at the end of this presentation I have a, um, a screenshot of a, a website that has all kinds of videos you can watch on how to do this. Um, uh, it is not easy but it is it, with some practice you can get quite good at it. So once you have the bird uh, transported to wherever it's going, um, how do you house a pet bird safely? And what should that cage environment be like? Um, <clears throat> obviously climate controlled for most of these guys. Um, 
we, we talked about that already. Um, they are not acclimated to winter temperatures. Um, ideally, keep them away from dogs and cats. So if you've got a shelter uh, situation or rescue situation where you've got dogs and cats as well, if it's possible, if there's another room uh, where you can, you know, put the birds, shut the door, at least minimize some of that, uh, uh, the barking sounds, the smells, um, that sort of thing, that is gonna keep the birds a lot less stressed. Uh, be sure you're using non-toxic and secure cage materials, ideally things that are, are built for and made for birds, um, as opposed to homemade types of things. Um, you know, if it was a home environment, I always tell people get the biggest cage you possibly can, you know, if the, especially if the bird is in that cage a lot, um, in a shelter environment, obviously things are different. So ideally you want a cage where the bird can flap its wings and not hit its wing feathers on the cage. Um, you don't want to break the tail feathers in too small of a cage. Um, and you definitely want to perch. So again, they're off the ground and they're not standing in their own uh, poop or droppings. Um, usually there's food in water bowls. Um, and then of course, you know, depending on how long you have the bird, if it's for 24 hours, I wouldn't worry about it, but if it's longer, uh, toys and, and enrichment. Nutrition, just to touch a little bit on bird nutrition. So again, in these birds' natural environments, they are eating uh, just a very diverse seasonal, uh, you know, season, seasonally available types of foods um, that we don't even have access to in, in, uh, in captive environments. So um, yes, they do eat seeds. Um, they also eat nuts. Um, they may eat insects, flowers, and nectar. So again, it depends on the species. It's, it's truly impossible for us to replicate what their natural diet should be. Um, maybe some zoos do it, but uh, as a private individual, it's pretty difficult. So what do people feed birds? Well, unfortunately, if you go to the pet store and you go to the bird food aisle, you will often see stuff that looks like this. So this is a uh, seed mix. Um, it's marketed to really every different species of bird. So even though these are birds live in different environments all over the world in their natural environment and are eating completely different things, um, this is what people think to offer them. Um, so this is uh, not a good uh, nutrition, uh, nutrition source of nutrition for, for these birds. Uh, okay, it's not nutritionally complete, very high in oil. Seeds are mostly oil and fats, and, there's, and they're lacking in uh, uh, many vitamins and minerals. And if you look at the picture of the close-up of the seed mix in this slide, you'll see those pink seeds and those bright green seeds. And you're like, well, what are those? Um, that doesn't look like any seed I've ever seen. Well, they actually will spray vitamins and things onto these seed mixes um, so that they can say that they've been fortified and that they're balanced and complete. But if you think about it, the bird is actually going to take the shell off of that seed. They don't eat the shell. So again, not an ideal diet. What is an ideal diet? Well, the best that we can do would be to offer a formulated diet, which is a bird pellet. We will have some slides about that coming up, um, supplemented with safe, fresh foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and nuts. So there are many different types of formulated diets out there now for birds. Um, these really do look kind of like a dog or cat kibble. Um, they're pellet, they're also referred to as pellets. Um, they are supposedly balanced. They have all the fiber, the protein, the sugars, the you know, fats, everything the bird needs um, sort of in this one chunk. So the bird can't pick out certain seeds or certain things like they can from the seed mix. Um, like the seed mix, they might pick out all the sunflower seeds and throw all the other seeds in that mix on the floor. Um, not ideal. Um, here's the problem, okay? If you get a bird in, maybe you don't know much about its history. Um, maybe it, all, all it's ever eaten is a seed mix. Um, so you might, in being a good intentioned person who cares about the welfare of animals might say, well, I'm going to give this bird um, these pellets. Um, they're much healthier. Um, and then I'm going to offer some, some fresh fruits. Um, well, that bird very well may not eat those things. 
uh, and birds will literally go on a hunger strike. They will not eat um, foods that they have never seen before and they think that they don't like. So um, unfortunately, if you're in a shelter situation, you may need to have some of that seed mix on hand. Um, it can be a process. Converting a bird to a healthy diet can actually take quite some time. It can take many weeks um, to get them to try a new food. Um, so again, you don't want to harm the bird by taking away the only food that they know um, in your attempt to make a healthier nutrition. Uh, uh, yeah. um, keep, in bird, uh, keep in mind birds also, um, many of them love to actually put their food in their water and soak it and make a weird soup. Um, they're really messy and you need to change those water dishes usually more than once a day, um, especially if you have a bird who likes to make soup. There are foods that are toxic to birds, um, really any animal. If you're not uh, sure about um, what foods are potentially toxic, just look it up. There's tons of information on the internet. Um, don't offer, uh, obviously, a food that if, you, if you're not sure that it's safe. Um, so okay, chocolate, caffeine, um, some mushrooms, alcohol, salts, um, avocado. Okay, we want to avoid those in birds, but they really can eat so many other things. Um, you know, all the types of foods we eat. Um, and again, there's lots of information online. <clears throat> so if you have these birds for longer periods of time, you certainly want to think about um, enrichment. Um, what is normal bird behavior? Um, you want to encourage normal bird behavior. You want to encourage a, a socialized um, and you know, uh, adapted bird. So um, the birds are loud, they should be loud. They, are, they should be vocalizing. If a bird is really quiet and isn't vocalizing, it's probably a sign that it's, too, it's, it's scared, it's withdrawn, maybe even sick. Um, they are social, they do respond to people or maybe other birds. Um, they're very intelligent. They can be territorial of their cage, what they consider their area. Uh, uh, if it's outside, if it is a place where they spend time outside of the cage. Um, they are messy and destructive. The toys that you offer, they're not just sort of knocking those toys around. Um, they're destroying them. They're chewing them into little pieces. That is how they play. Um, they can bond to one person. And this can be difficult, of course. Um, when birds are getting separated from owners, um, separated, um, they can bond to another bird. Um, and so there's some emotional things involved with, with that sort of behavior that birds have. Um, and many owners don't train their birds. So they're, you know, they, they're not used to coming out of the cage um, to interact and have exercise and enrichment. Um, what do they like to do? A, a, like a well-adapted socialized bird. Um, well, flying is great if it's safe. Um, climbing, whether it's in their cage or on some sort of play stand. Uh, they love to forage for their food. So again, these toys that you see on the right side of the, um, the slide here, these are just um, inexpensive toys that can be made with, uh, you know, household items, cardboards and string and stuff like that, the egg carton there. Um, so you can actually hide food or treats in these toys and the birds can um, break these things open to look for their food. It, it, again, it's, they're highly intelligent. Um, it's, this is what they would be doing in the wild. Um, it can occupy them mentally um, and keep them physically active as well. Um, they like music, they like other birds. And then of course, how to recognize a sick bird. <clears throat> Some of it's common sense. Um, like I didn't, I didn't list on this slide, I would run out of room. Things like excessive sneezing um, or coughing. Um, I, I feel like that's sort of common sense. Um, not eating and drinking, um, that's common sense, but um, definitely one of the number one things to look out for um, a bird who's just completely not eating um, or not drinking. Sleeping more. Um, birds who are sick have trouble maintaining their body temperature, so they tend to fluff out their feathers uh, in order to help trap some air in there and, and stay warm. Um, they might be, uh, their posture might be hunched or, or different in some way. They're not standing tall and straight. 
And a very sick bird will actually be too weak to perch and they might come down and be spending time at the bottom of the cage. And that's usually a pretty bad sign. And you might also notice some changes in their droppings. Um, and again, all of our prey species, all of these animals um, that are part of flocks or are trying to hide from predators, um, they hide when they're sick. So the, but by the time you notice that they're sick, um, that illness is usually pretty advanced. So you don't want to delay in getting some veterinary assistance. I'm going to move on to small mammals. Just, um, so again, a lot of different types of small mammals. Um, I'd say the most common um, are the ones that you'll find more commonly in a shelter rescue type environment are your rabbits, your small rodents. Um, some areas of the country, chinchillas are very popular. Um, other areas, ferrets are more popular. Um, guinea pigs, definitely. Um, and then, um, you know, people do keep hedgehogs. Uh, occasionally you'll get a mini pig, um, which might be small or might be quite large. Um, and sugar gliders, unfortunately, are also kept as pets and some, in certain parts of the US and I imagine Canada, they, they seem to be quite popular. Um, so again, just um, quickly on transport, uh, same sort of thing, a hard plastic carrier is preferred. Um, these are animals that might pee or poop uh, while they're being transported. So putting some type of bedding or absorbent towel. At, uh, uh, also, you don't want them sliding around. Um, many of these guys have fur on the bottom of their feet instead of foot pads. So you want them to feel secure in there. That uh, hard plastic carrier also uh, makes them feel covered and secure. Um, you know, these are animals that uh, if they're feeling nervous, um, will will tend to hide. They'll go under something or um, you know, it, into a box or something where they feel more, feel more secure. Um, they are not as sensitive to winter temperatures, but obviously if you have any indoor animal, um, you don't want to leave it out in very, very cold winter temperatures for very long. Um, they're just not acclimated. Um, and then these guys, are, you know, are generally all covered in fur. They cannot sweat. Um, so they're actually, you have to be careful about too high temperatures. So over 27 Celsius, um, we worry about heat stroke. So keep that in mind. Um, and again, just keeping them away from dogs and cats if possible. Um, and then, oh yeah, the uh, avoid the cardboard boxes if you can. Um, I can't tell you how many animals come into my hospital and by the time they get there, they're they're basically almost out of their carrier <clears throat> or box. It's not really a carrier, is it? Um, handling, uh, that's going to be different based on the species. Um, these animals, most of them can bite if they're scared. Um, they could kick, especially rabbits have very powerful hind legs. Um, and then they can scratch um, if they're struggling and they have sharp nails. Uh, so that's what you kind of want to look out for. Um, in general, you want to just support their body and limit the amount of time they're sort of floating in the air. These are not animals that like to be picked up in general. They like to have all four feet on the ground. Uh, so if we can, you know, just support them by um, pushing them up against your body um, and squeezing them, making sure they have support underneath them. Um, and again, minimizing restraint time. Um, we definitely don't recommend, uh, you know, scruffing these animals to pick them up. Um, it's better to really scoop them up from underneath and support them better. Um, and certainly we, we would not recommend picking a rabbit up by its ears. That would be painful. There is a towel technique for mammals as well, uh, also known as the bunny burrito or the guinea pig burrito. Um, and again, just literally putting these animals in a towel, wrapping the towel around them uh, sort of securely. Um, it just, it makes, it calms them down. Um, and uh, it, you know, it means they can't 
bite or, well, they can't scratch you or kick you uh, because they're nice and enclosed in, in the towel there. I suppose they could still bite if they wanted to. Um, and again, um, I have some resources at the end of this lecture for uh, videos you can watch. I mean, you, YouTube, you can go on YouTube and watch videos about this. Um, but the um, uh, Lefebvre's company also has some like more veterinary uh, oriented restraint videos for small mammals and birds and reptiles. Um, small mammals can be quite difficult. So these are hamsters, gerbils, mice, potentially. Um, these guys can be really difficult to pick up. They may have never been picked up before. Sometimes these are just cage animals. Um, their owners enjoy them simply just by looking at them running around in their cage. Um, if they're friendly, if they're used to being picked up, you can pick them up and there's usually no problem. If they are not used to being picked up, they will definitely run away from you, squirm, bite. Um, you know, so um, what we often do with a, an animal that is not used to being picked up is we have these critter keepers. Um, uh, you see these at most pet stores. It's like this clear plastic with a, a lid on the top, um, little handle there on the top. So you can actually just take a small one of these and um, take the lid off and just scoop the animal up out of its tank or whatever it's in um, and <clears throat> make sure you put the lid back on so they don't jump out um, and you can actually do even a, a basic exam um, because the plastic is clear you can get an idea of how that animal is breathing um, does it have nasal or eye discharge what does its skin look like is it fat is it thin um, all of that without actually holding them so there are many different ways to house small mammals. Um, unfortunately, the, I think the thing people think of is this cage pictured on the slide here. Um, you can do a lot better than that. Uh, it really depends on how long these animals are going to be in your shelter uh, or rescue. Um, you definitely don't want a wire bottom or a wire surface. Um, people think that that is good because the animal's poop and pee will fall through the wire uh, into a lower level and they won't be standing on it. Um, but the wire can actually be very abrasive to the bottom of their feet. Um, so we do like a solid plastic or some type of solid uh, flooring. Um, and then you can cover that with bedding. Um, we do recommend different types of recycled paper beddings over the wood chips. The wood chips do uh, produce um, some aromatic oils that can be irritating to the skin and to the respiratory system of the animal. Um, and wood chips aren't really absorbent in any way um, and can be dusty or even have mold. Um, so again, there's a lot of recycled paper bedding options that are a little better, a little safer. Um, some of these small mammals will use a litter box, mainly rabbits and ferrets. Um, again, we don't use cat litter. Uh, we use the recycled paper bedding, um, food bowls, uh, wa water bottles versus bowls. Um, a lot of people think of these animals drinking out of water bottles. Um, they've actually done studies to show that the animals actually prefer to drink out of a bowl. Um, so we try when we can to offer um, a, a water bowl, something heavy that they can't knock over. Um, it really depends on the setup. Sometimes bedding and stuff gets in the water and it's not practical, but the water bottles themselves, you know, sometimes the little nozzles malfunction and the animal can't actually get the water out. Um, so there's just issues with the bottles that um, there aren't with the bowls. Um, hiding areas, uh, uh, very important, right? Uh, for these prey species um, and enrichment for them as well. Um, they love chew toys. Um, they will sleep in little beds. <clears throat> so here's an example of um, obviously a little better, bigger, um, more enriched environment um, for this looks, uh, these are guinea pigs in this, in this picture. So um, uh, hiding area, tunnels and things that they can chew. Um, in this case, they do have a, a water bottle, um, hay. Uh, here's a, a rabbit enclosure set up. Um, you can see those two litter boxes there. 
um, with some recycled paper bedding and some hay inside the litter boxes. Um, rabbits do like beds. Um, they do need access to hay at all times, food, water. So in this case, you can see both a water bottle and a water bowl um, and toys and, and things like that. Here's some ferrets. Ooh, that slide's kind of blurry, um, but I think you get the gist. Um, chew toys, um, hammocks, um, balls, toys, food bowls, um, and as much space as you can possibly give them. Smaller mammals, um, a lot of people still still house hamsters and gerbils and rats in um, these sort of aquarium type setups. Um, you know, again, it's, uh, they can be okay if it's big enough. Um, there's not a lot of ventilation in, in an aquarium, in an enclosed aquarium, um, but you can put a lot of accessories and things in there. Um, they market a lot of these more open type of cages as well. Um, these guys love to burrow and tunnel and chew. So having that in mind when setting up a cage, you know, having a, a very um, deep layer of bedding for them to, uh, to tunnel down and, and to sleep under uh, is, is good. Um, and, and these guys will use running wheels for exercise. So will chinchillas, um, rats. Uh, so again, you can always double check online whether you're, if you're not familiar, um, whether the animal you have, you're dealing with will use a running wheel. If they do, um, definitely give them one. It's a really good source of exercise and enrichment. A little bit about nutrition. Um, small mammals come in a variety of uh, herbivores, so plant-eating, omnivores, um, which eat plants and uh, protein, and carnivores uh, like ferrets um, that are pretty much just meat-eating. Um, most of these guys have their own formulated diets. Um, they still sell seed mixes for these animals. Um, and things that look like seed mixes. Um, but again, um, it's always best to go with a formulated diet and you can supplement that with treats and other things. Um, so a lot of different choices there. There's some brands that are obviously more reputable than others. <clears throat> um, and then the species that are, you know, are true herbivores like rabbits and guinea pigs and chinchillas, they need a, a constant a free choice source of hay, grass hay, so something like Timothy hay, orchard grass hay, brome hay, whatever you got. Um, alfalfa is not a hay, it's a legume, um, so you don't want to overdo that. Um, really try and find a good grass hay. Um, and then fresh foods, vegetables, uh, for like rabbits, you can feed them leafy green things. Um, ferrets can have fresh, you know, protein treats. Um, so here's an example of this sort of seed mix type diet that they market for rabbits, which is completely inappropriate. Yes, they will eat the corn, they will eat the seeds. Are they supposed to? Are they designed to digest that stuff? Absolutely not. So um, it's really not a good choice. Um, you want to get a, you know, a, a grass hay based pellet um, and, and, you know, feed the appropriate amount. Okay, you shouldn't be feeding more pellets than hay. Uh, a lot of commonly kept pets will have information like this on uh, online um, about how to feed them. Um, so again, um, these are a couple different like food pyramid or um, food graphs here for appropriate feeding of rabbits. So you, again, 80% of their diet should be grass hay. That means you might need to limit the amount of pellets, like if they eat too many of the pellets um, or prefer to eat the pellets rather than the hay, you may need to measure out or limit those pellets. Um, and then you can supplement with leafy green things. And they, and they have treats um, marketed for rabbits, um, all of these animals. And again, treats should just be a very limited part of their diet. So how do you recognize a sick mammal? Um, again, um, not eating, not drinking, not pooping. Okay, generally if an animal is not pooping, if you don't see poop in that cage, that means it's not eating. 
a, a lot of these small mammals, it can be hard to tell if they're eating. A hamster, for example, will empty its food bowl and you'll go in there and you'll say, oh, the food bowl's empty. But they've actually just packed their cheek pouches full of all the food and then moved it to a different part of their enclosure and buried it under several layers of bedding. Uh, so unless you're digging through the bedding looking for food, um, you're going to think that animal's eating and it, it might not be. Um, same with rabbits and guinea pigs. Um, it can be really difficult to tell how much hay they're eating. Um, it, yeah, unless you're actually watching them eat hay. Um, so these are animals, it's not like a dog where you put down a bowl of food and the dog finishes the bowl and you're like, okay, my dog's eating. Um, these are animals that sort of graze throughout the day. Um, and, you know, yeah. Um, so lethargy, uh, obviously that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, breathing sounds, uh, difficulty breathing, increased respiratory rate, sneezing, nasal eye discharge, diarrhea, things like this are um, of concern. Um, one of the things that I teach the staff in our New York City shelter system, because um, in addition to dogs and cats, they actually do adopt out, they, they intake, house, and spay, neuter, and adopt out rabbits and guinea pigs now. Um, so um, we do a big training for the staff there and how, you know, when you're walking through and you're, you're, you know, you come in in the morning and you're looking through, you're looking at all the animals and to get a general assessment of how everyone's doing, um, what are you looking for? So in this example, how do we know that this rabbit is eating? Well, two things that are kind of obvious to me. One, the food bowl's empty. Um, so that's where the pellets would be. Now the hay, there's hay there, but who knows how much hay was there. Maybe that rabbit did eat some hay, maybe it didn't. Um, but it's hard to it's hard to tell with hay, but we can see the food bowl, it's empty. The other thing we can see is a bunch of poop. <laughs> so this rabbit decided not to use this litter box. Um, and so for good demonstration purposes, you can see the rabbit is pooping, um, normal looking poops. So again, we know this rabbit's eating. It wouldn't be passing feces if it wasn't eating. Um, this might seem strange if you're not used to small mammals, um, but it's always good to know what a normal poop looks like. Because um, not only do you need to be checking for it to be sure that animal's eating, um, you should also be looking for things that look bad. Um, so again, rabbits make these perfectly round little ball type poops. Uh, guinea pigs, um, more oblong there in that center photo. Uh, okay, and so things that are small or misshaped or covered in mucus would be a sign of bad poop. Um, one of the more common things that we see in the shelter environment with our small mammals is diarrhea. Um, it doesn't mean that they, you know, have worms and, it, you know, usually it's because, um, although they can have intestinal parasites, um, that should be part of screening, but um, a lot of times it's because they're, the food that they're being offered in the shelter is different from what they've, they've got at home. Um, they might be used to eating a very low fi fiber diet. They might only be eating pellets um, at home and not hay or not enough hay. Um, they're going to be stressed, um, you know, even in our big, Manhattan City Shelter, the, the rabbits have their own room, but even in that room with the door shut, you can hear dogs barking. So they're gonna be stressed. Um, and of course, diarrhea can be secondary, secondary to other illness as well. Um, so again, we consider this, this is worth a veterinary exam or a veterinary consultation. This is not normal. Okay, the last section here is Reptiles. Um, I'll try and go quickly. Um, so again, there are, oh gosh, 10,000 plus species of reptiles in the world and there's very little regulation about what people can have as pets. You just never know what's gonna come through the door. If you work for an organization that deals with reptiles, I guarantee you will probably come across something um, at some point that uh, you're not you're not sure what it is. 
Um, so again, they come in <laughs> lizard form, uh, snake form, and the chelonians um, or turtles and tortoises. There are three broad categories. <clears throat> and of course, in their native environments, they are, uh, many are endangered or threatened. So as far as taking care of reptiles properly, uh, one of the most important things for you to know is that they are ectotherms. Uh, the other term people use for them is cold-blooded. Um, what does that mean? It basically means that they rely on the temperature of the environment to regulate their own body temperature. Okay, so they're very different from mammals and birds. Um, uh, the temperatures that they're housed in, are, it's super important for their well-being um, and health. They have scaled skin. They have many, many different dietary habits. Um, in addition to the ones we've mentioned already, uh, herbivore, omnivore, and carnivore, we also have some reptiles that only eat insects. Uh, and then they have very different habits, um, whether they're active during the day, diurnal, or active at night. Um, and then of course, they're from all over the world. They might live in trees, they might live underground. Um, transport and handling, Luckily, these guys don't necessarily chew out of cages, um, but they are very good at escaping. So you do want to be sure that there aren't any little gaps that they can fit through. Make sure those cages or carriers are locked because um, they are strong and they can get out. Um, definitely you want heat support. Uh, again, most of our pet reptiles uh, are not from Canada or the US, they're from tropical, subtropical climates, so they need that heat support. Um, restraint, again, is going to depend very much on the species. Uh, they can bite, they can scratch, and um, lizards, for example, can whip you with their tails. Um, and then you do want to watch out. Uh, there are some species that, uh, when threatened, will uh, have tail autotomy. And that is when the tail separates from the body. Uh, so again, you are picking this animal up, you're doing a brief exam, you're moving it into a different enclosure, and all of a sudden the tail falls off. So that's not ideal. Um, that is, again, uh, if they're being hunted in the wild, this is a way they distract their predator. Um, the predator will hopefully go for the tail while the animal escapes. They can regrow the tail to a certain extent, but um, it doesn't look like the normal tail. Um, so if this is someone's pet, obviously you don't really want that to happen. So, you know, what is the ideal reptile uh, enclosure or housing? Um, I mean, honestly, you're really just trying to recreate what this animal's natural environment would be. Um, they are not designed to just live in your house. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, so heat, Obviously, we talked about a little bit already. Uh, UVB light exposure, so that's the, um, the UVB uh, wavelengths from sunlight that are, we don't have indoors with our indoor light bulbs. Um, humidity, hugely important. Um, water source, you know, again, most of the time just a water bowl is good, but there's some reptiles like chameleons who will only drink from drops, droplets on leaves. Um, they won't necessarily drink out of a bowl. Um, they definitely need hiding areas and, of course, enrichment um, and taking their natural habits into consideration when setting them up. Now, obviously, if you are temporary ho temporarily housing some reptiles, um, you, you're not going to be making elaborate enclosures. Um, you know, some of the basic things that you want are that heat support, some UVB light if you can. Um, you know, but again, putting in live plants and, and you know, all of this enrichment and, uh, you know, it's complicated. So um, you do the best that you can in a shelter environment. So all reptiles have um, a uh, preferred optimal temperature zone that they, they want to be in. And again, you can look this up online if you're not familiar with the species you're dealing with. Um, and it, basically within that enclosure, you're providing a, a basking or hot area where that animal can move to, to heat themselves up, um, and then a cool area where they can move to when they need to cool themselves down. And then they will thermoregulate, um, essentially they will move back and forth from the hot and the cold environments 
uh, micro environments um, to maintain their ideal uh, body temperature. Um, how can you provide supplemental heat? Um, they make special heating pads for reptiles. Um, we generally don't recommend that you use the ones that are sold for humans. Um, they can malfunction. Um, so again, a reptile appropriate heating pad. Um, you do not want that animal to come into direct contact with that heating pad. Those are meant to go um, on the side of the tank or under the tank so that the glasses uh, of the tank uh, or whatever the tank is made of, there's a, a barrier between the animal and, and the heating pad. Um, and then they make all sorts of light um, things that screw into light type fixtures uh, that can give heat. And it's very important that you have thermometers in there. I can't tell you how many people come in and I say, oh, great, you've got all these lights and you've got this heating pad. And uh, well, so what's the temperatures in the enclosure? And they don't know because they didn't bother to put a thermometer. Um, so it's pretty useless. So make sure you have some thermometers on hand. Um, we definitely uh, discourage the use of hot rocks. These days, um, we found that uh, animals do get burned. Um, so again, you, you don't want um, the, heat, the animal to come into direct contact with the heat source. There should be some kind of barrier. Um, and this has to do with how they perceive temperature, um, a little different from mammals. Um, so this is what um, some thermal burns look like. <clears throat> so like, that snake on the top right, um, you know, its belly is burned, probably from coming into contact with um, a heating pad or a hot rock or something like that. Um, and the chameleon and the iguana, um, those animals probably climbed up very high in their tank and got too close to a light bulb, um, a heat producing light fixture of some sort, and then, and then burned their dorsum there. So, so keep that in mind when setting things up. UVB lights can get um, a little complicated. You really have to know what you're looking for and be able to differentiate UVB producing light bulbs from just regular light bulbs that produce light and heat only. Um, so UVB lights come in mercury vapor types of bulbs, which are large round bulbs that produce UVB and heat. Um, and then you've got fluorescent type UVB bulbs. Um, uh, they don't produce a lot of heat, um, but they do produce light and UVB wavelengths. Why is this so important? We could have a whole lecture for several hours on why this is important. Um, the main thing you need to know is without that UVB light exposure, reptiles cannot metabolize calcium, meaning you might be putting a calcium supplement on their food and feeding them foods rich in calcium, but they're, it's, they're not getting it. Their body isn't utilizing it. Um, and this can cause, um, in addition to bone diseases, many other types of health problems as well. So again, on the left there, that's a turtle with an extremely deformed shell. You can see it's all curled up uh, around the edges there um, instead of a dome shape. Um, on the bottom left, there's a bearded dragon. You can see the, the severe deviation in its spine. Um, so it's, it's vertebrae are basically not uh, straight and um, have grown in a deformed way. And then when we x-ray uh, these animals, um, you can see there on those x-rays, so the normal x-ray, the bones show up as they should, bright sort of white on the x-ray. You look at the animal, the lizard, with metabolic bone disease or calcium deficiency, um, you can't even see the bones in this, this animal's body, okay? So this is a very, very serious problem and it's entirely preventable. So again, here's um, an example schematic for setting up um, lighting and temperatures um, in an enclosure. So you have a hot side. Um, so this is for bearded dragon, for example, right? Um, so these guys love a basking temperature or a hot, hot temperature um, of 33 to 43 Celsius. And then over on the cool side, um, it can be you know, that 20, 24 to 29 Celsius. Um, in this example, we've got some basking lamps um, that are producing the heat. Um, and then we also have that long fluorescent tube bulb um, producing um, you know, 10.0 to 12.0 UVB light tube. The, those specifications mean like how far the UVB penetrates down uh, from the bulb. Um, you know, a 5.0 bulb would be probably like eight inches. The animal would have to be within eight inches of that bulb. 
um, the 10 to 12.0 um, <clears throat> obviously will penetrate further, maybe up to 18 inches. So this gets really complicated. We don't have enough time to go over it today. But again, if you're dealing with a lot of reptiles or if you are inspecting facilities that are housing reptiles, you should understand what this stuff means. They, they do make UVB meters. You can measure um, whether these animals are getting appropriate exposure to UVB from their setups. Um, and they do make like infrared uh, temperature guns um, so you can go in and take temperatures and make sure that each species has the adequate temperature and UVB exposure that it needs. Humidity is very important. Um, a lot of these are tropical species that are kept as pets uh, so you've got to work really really hard to increase the humidity or keep the humidity up especially in the winter. Um, so again try and maintain it 80% or higher humidity in uh, Canada in January. Good luck. Um, so when that doesn't happen, um, these guys can start to have issues as well with chronic dehydration and shedding issues. And this is kind of what uh, some shedding problems or um, dissectesis, um, that's the medical term, uh, looks like in reptiles. So again, they should, as they grow and, and uh, <clears throat> they shed their skin, um, that's normal, um, but it shouldn't really be stuck on them um, ever. Uh, so again, these animals have some issues where their, their shed is stuck onto them. Nutrition, again, super complicated. We could have a whole several hour lecture on reptile nutrition. Um, just know that um, you have to, you know, it's all species specific, um, so you need to look up each species. Um, there are unfortunately no complete formulated diets for reptiles, so feeding them is even more complicated than the other animals we've talked about. Um, they, some companies are making some type of formulated pellets and things like that, but um, they're, they're, not, they're not ideal. They're not meant to be completely the only thing the animal eats. Uh, so carnivores, um, again, I think most people think of snakes. Um, that's probably the most commonly kept reptile carnivore. Um, and these guys uh, are, you know, generally people feed rodents, small rodents. Um, we definitely recommend feeding a pre-killed rodent. You can get them frozen and thaw them out and feed them um, versus live. So there are, there are so many issues um, sometimes with the live rodent causing harm to the reptile. So that should be avoided. Um, some of the other carnivorous lizards might need, <clears throat> in addition to rodents, um, eggs, uh, insects, um, things from the supermarket, fish, things like that. Um, omnivores, uh, again, a combination of plant matter and protein. So bearded dragons are, are probably a good example of this. Um, they're a fairly commonly kept reptile. Um, and, you know, again, lots of information on the internet. Um, these guys can have leafy greens, um, some insects, um, and most all reptiles, we do recommend using a multivitamin or calcium supplement on their food, since it's very hard for us to give them the sort of variety that they need. So herbivores like um, turtles and well, tortoises, um, I mean, a lot of turtles are more omnivorous, but you know, let's say like a Russian tortoise, um, really it's gonna have a diet very heavy in <clears throat> leafy green vegetables or even grasses and, and, and things like that. So um, they can eat small amount of fruit, but it's uh, not meant to be a large part of their diet. And then insectivores. So they're, um, you know, pet stores that sell reptiles um, and then lots of online merchants uh, have insects for sale that you can feed. Um, the common ones are mealworms and waxworms and crickets. There are some healthier options out there these days like the dubia roaches, hornworms, silkworms, and soldier fly larvae um, which go as phoenix worms or calcium worms um, at least in the U.S. Um, so again um, you want to be sure those insects are very healthy um, and fed and hydrated before you feed them to your lizard. Um, and, uh, and again, because you're not feeding, you know, you're probably not feeding all of those different types all at once, um, a good calcium or multivitamin powder sprinkled on top of those insects will help to balance out some deficiencies. 
Um, and just to finish up here, how to recognize a sick reptile. Uh, obviously, they stop eating, drinking, defecating. Um, they're very lethargic. Maybe they're not basking normally. Um, they're hiding. Um, and then obvious changes in their skin. Maybe their eyes are closed and puffy or sunken in. Um, respiratory sounds, uh, nasal discharge, um, vomiting, diarrhea, and then obviously weight loss. Um, and then this is the, um, there's, there's, there's so many resources online, but this one, uh, La Fever Vet, I use this with my students a lot. They have, they have tons of videos on uh, nutrition and on handling um, that are, are, are pretty intensive. There's a, a webinar that you can take that's an hour, maybe it's two hours, just on handling of exotics. Um, and you don't need to be a veterinarian. Um, if you're at all, you know, working with animals, you can sign up and have access to these to these videos and, and resources. They have a lot of articles as well. <clears throat> and that is the end. Okay, that's, that's a great, a that's, that's a, actually a, a, a wealth of uh, really useful information and a great segue into the talks that, that follow today. Um, I wanted to start off with a question myself since uh, I've got the microphone, so I'm able to do that. Um, there's a lot of uh, birds that are, that are kept uh, deflighted. Either they're not allowed to fly or they may be pinioned or have their wings clipped. And having seen parrots and other species of birds in Latin America and Asia and see them fly, it seems like that's the removal when they're deflated of a fundamental aspect of their life. So my question to you is, uh, do you think shelters should be uh, adopting birds out that go into situations where they're not able to ex exercise that fundamental aspect of their lives? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I would say the trend in veterinary medicine these days is that we would prefer to never ever trim a bird's wings to prevent flight. Um, it's not only is it important for exercise and their physical health, um, we believe it's also important for the, their emotional health. Uh, the problem is of course that um, if you have an untrained bird and you bring it into your home and you want to let it out of your cage or out of its cage um, for exercise and enrichment, um, if it's able to fly up and away and it gets onto the top bookshelf and starts eating your photo albums and peeling the veneer off your cabinets, um, then it becomes a problem and then that person doesn't want that pet anymore. So you know, if you can train a bird, you can, you can train birds to fly um, to certain places for exercise. Um, I have a lot of clients whose bird's wings are not trimmed um, and they've just worked with that bird so it's not destroying the house. Um, but again, if your shelter is overrun and you've got someone who, um, you know, is willing to take a bird, you've you got to weigh the, the pros and the cons, like, should that bird be, you know, in a I don't know, in a cage alone forever, or you know, would it be better off um, having attention from, from a, a family? You know, it's, that's a tricky one, but we always recommend training and not trimming bird's wings uh, first. Okay, uh, we have a question um, that is, what are the housing capacity limits for some of the smaller rodents, mice, et cetera? And is there also a housing limit for birds in one cage? So I assume by housing limit, you mean like dimensions, like space. Um, so, I mean, that's, that gets tricky because obviously in a, in a home environment, if this was someone's pet, um, I would say provide it with the absolute largest enclosure or tank that you possibly can that fits in your house that you can afford, right? It, this is an animal that's spending the majority of its time in that enclosure. Um, 
and you want as much enrichment in there and you want that animal to have as much space as possible. Um, if you're talking about a shelter, um, you know, that's supposedly only temporarily housing these animals, you know, I imagine there's a lot of limits on, on what's reasonable as far as the space and what, what can be afforded. Um, you know, at the bare minimum, they should have a running wheel, they should have a water bowl, a food bowl, a hiding area, um, you know, bedding to dig in. You know, there, I, there's no, I, I guess there's no ideal dimensions. It's as, as large as possible. Okay. Uh, another question that, that came in is um, a lot of kids pester their parents to get them certain animals as pets. I did this when I was young. I badgered my parents until they wanted to kill me to get all kinds of animals. Uh, what would you say to parents whose kids are, are badgering them to get an exotic pet? What would, you, what would your advice to them be? Um. My advice would be to not get that, not get a pet. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think I've been warped by my years of, you know, dealing with these pets that are uh, unwanted and, and sick and sort of, you know, children. Uh, people think their kids are just going to be uh, perfect and take care of these pets until the pet dies and that never happens. Okay, maybe it does in a small percentage of cases, but usually it's the parents end up caring for the pet. The child loses interest uh, after a short period of time. And then, of course, they go off to school or college or whatever. And we've got all these these parents who are stuck with animals they didn't really want. Um, so, yeah, I would say don't get one <laughs> unless you put a lot, a lot of thought and research into it. Well, your answer, is a, your answer is a good segue into the next question. Someone was saying that it looks very expensive to properly house and care for exotic animals. And, uh, he or she doesn't specify what kind, but, um, it, you know, uh, is it expensive? Um, I, I, I know in my own experience, I thought it was very expensive, but what, what would you say? Is it expensive to keep exotic pets? Of course. It, I think it's more expensive than a dog or cat. Um, so, yeah, none of that stuff is cheap, um, and especially you start getting to some of that specialized, those specialized diets, and um, you know, like a bird cage for a large bird, um, it, you know, those can be several thousand dollars. Um, you know, so there's this misconception that these, you know, little exotic pets are somehow going to be easier because they live in a cage, and um, you know. Or, or like maybe a hamster, it doesn't, it doesn't live that long. Um, but I, you know, I, I think it's a, a disservice for that information to be out there because um, it's just not true. Right. Okay, uh, we actually have to move on. There, there are some other questions that I think you can access and answer. Okay. Um, but we're going to move on to the next session. So thank you, uh, Dr. Wilson, great presentation. And I'm sure everybody who is watching got some very useful information for, uh, for their own interest or for their professional use. Great, thank you so much for having me. Take care. Okay, we're going to move on now to the second session. And uh, I'll just reiterate the point that we will have a break after this next session, which I'm sure you'll find both interesting and, and entertaining. And the session is by Dr. Adrian Walton, who's a veterinarian from the Duden Animal Hospital in British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Walton originally wanted to be Jacques Cousteau so did I, and got as far as training seals, swimming with whales, and studying exotic saltwater, the exotic uh, saltwater fish trade in the Philippines. Uh, once he realized he looked horrible in a toque, he switched to veterinary medicine as now, now uh, a small animal practitioner in BC. Uh, due to him accidentally offering to help the BCSPCA with a bunch of weird animals at the museum, he suddenly became the go-to guy when anything unusual shows up. I'm assuming he means exotic animals. Uh, this led to having the licensed rescue for illegal rep 
a licensed rescue for illegal reptiles and amphibians in BC, teaching various animal welfare organizations how to work up exotic animal seizures and assisting in the development of standards of care for reptiles in universities and labs. Uh, working the intersection between animal welfare, government, and the reptile lobby, Dr. Walton aims to improve the welfare of captive reptiles and amphibians in any way he can. Uh, his title, uh, fanciful, interesting title, Retail Cruelty, Ace Ventura Meets Them All. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy his presentation, so we'll turn it over now to Dr. Adrian Walton. Uh, thanks, Rob. Just confirming you can actually hear me. I can hear you, yes. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. My name, is, as I said, is Dr. Walton. Uh, I want to introduce you to uh, the reason I got into reptiles. This is Nancy. Uh, Nancy is actually my first pet. I got her when I was seven. And that was a long, long time ago when we really didn't know how to really take care of these animals. That's the reason why she looks more like a, a VW bug than an actual box turtle. Let's see if I can make sure that I'm actually having control of this. So far, it's a little, I'm not getting control of the uh, screen. There we go. So yes, uh, there's me catching toes as a child. Uh, and I actually spent most of my childhood uh, going uh, through the woods and the ponds of Quebec looking for these unusual animals. And at the time they were in abundance and we're not seeing that abundance as much now. And again, uh, with the way society is kind of going into uh, the natural environment, you know, the things that I used to do as a kid is kind of frowned upon now. There we go. Uh, so again, the picture of Nancy. I actually have three tortoises and turtles now, uh, all of which are going to outlive me. So one of the things that I have been training my children from a very young age is to be able to take care of these animals. And unfortunately, this is one of the problems we see with pet reptiles is people getting these animals without a firm understanding of how long they live. These animals, as I said, in many cases can live over 100 years, but most of them will live 20 to 30 years. Now, I've worked a lot of different types of cruelty cases. Some of them you might be aware of. This is a picture of Trooper, uh, a dog that uh, was uh, brought into the BCSPCA uh, almost eight years ago. And thanks to the wonderful work of the SPCA, uh, Trooper lived an amazing life and unfortunately just passed away last year at the, uh, as a, a very mature and healthy dog. We've also been working with the Langley 66, which is a case of, uh, that we see with a lot of dog breeders. Uh, and one of the reasons why I really recommend that we come up with some system of which we can monitor breeding of all animals. And of course, the Whistler sled dog investigation, something that still to this day gives me nightmares. Now, specifically, we're here to talk about reptiles. Now, all of the pictures that you are going to see today are animals that were surrendered into my care, uh, and thus the reason I can actually share their photos. Uh, this is a chameleon that, uh, according to the person that this uh, was surrendered from, was perfectly healthy. And as you can see, it was not. Now, reptiles are going to be one of those situations where you're going to be dealing with irregularly, but when they do come in, they can be slightly problematic. Uh, we had a case of 100 illegal snakes found in a two-bedroom home in Mission, uh, ranging in size from 18 inches to 15 feet. Uh, this home was actually just uh, was abandoned at the time and wound up also being just behind a elementary school. We are also in, here in British Columbia, one of the main thoroughfares for venomous snakes to be brought in from uh, Southeast Asia. And one such case was found at the Canada Post Distribution Center. Of the four snakes, three of them had died uh, and one had survived and was in horrible shape. 
unfortunately, these were being shipped as China. Uh, and so it was a, a case of smuggling. And for those of you in the Winnipeg area, those snakes were going your way. And of course, our local, we have several people locally who like to collect reptiles and have had uh, several interactions with animal welfare groups over it. And the big one for those of you in Alberta was the drum hole, uh, Drumheller Reptile World closing. Uh, I actually hired the veterinarian that uh, did the, rep did the uh, initial complaint about that. And unfortunately, you know, the stuff that she was describing was quite horrific, including things like uh, after the season uh, was closed, he would turn off all the lights and heat go away for six months and come back and just replace anything that had died over the winter. And of course, Ontario has its own. We've had the, Aspr uh, the African cobra that was uh, found, the, uh, the venomous snake in Ajax running around, as well as uh, there was a case in Niagara region where a bunch of snakes were stolen. So this is uh, <laughs> this is one of those things that you're going to come across. And if, just so you know, in Ontario, uh, these snakes are perfectly legal, unless of course you are living in a jurisdiction that has said that they're illegal like Toronto. They're still there though. And of course the big one for Canada, which was the African rock python that killed two boys after escaping. This was actually a rescue that took in these snakes from the government and unfortunately did not house it appropriately. Now, there are cases that are ongoing, for instance, especially with COVID, a lot of these reptile facilities or education facilities are under a lot of financial stress. That means over the coming months, you're going to possibly be seeing these places go under. And unfortunately, you could be responsible for the animals that remain. Uh, every animal reptile rescue group or reptile education center across the country has been talking about how stressful the finances are they have at this time. For those of you in Winnipeg, you have a alligator running around right now. It's gone to another rescue. And here in British Columbia, because I know a few people are in BC are watching this, we have a bunch of reptiles being stored in a greenhouse. That's going to be a fun one down the road. But one of the problems with it, and the reason I put that photo up is it's so darn easy for us to treat reptiles as if they were a dog. And unfortunately, as Alex was so eloquent in pointing out, the treatment of these animals is very different than what you're used to in a shelter environment. Now, how common are these pets? And the truth is, is we don't really know. We know that the majority of Canadian households keep pets, uh, approximately seven and a half million households in, in Canada. 30% uh, of them, 37% own dogs, uh, or, or sorry, 37% own one or more cats, 32% own dogs. So, you know, we, we estimate between six million dogs, eight million cats. Now, the other animals, well, we, we don't really have a good handle on that. We, we know that 9% of Canadians own other animals, but we don't know exactly what they are. And this is where we can take some of the statistics that are coming out of the United States to give us an idea. And we know that reptile ownership over the last uh, decade has been steadily increasing. We're between two and 3%. Uh, so, you know, if we take that to Canada, and again, I am in Canada, that means we expect that about almost a half million, 400,000 households in Canada keep some kind of reptile. And, you know, uh, I initially did this presentation for Ontario, so that's 97,000 households. Now, the modern reptile industry, well, it started in about the 1990s, uh, but it's been around for many, many decades. We've been keeping uh, wild-caught reptiles uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a low, small, group of people that were breeding, but they basically worked amongst themselves, uh, local clubs that would share animals back and forth. But the commercial side of it really 
started to explore, explode in the 1990s. And that was with various captive bred animals like corn snakes and bearded dragons, and of course, ball pythons that you're gonna hear so much about. By 2011, it was a multi-billion dollar industry and it has been growing ever since. Matter of fact, most states now have a active reptile industry that meets and has these um, expos where animals are sold. And as I said, they, they mostly started off as captive breeding operations and you know people have made their hobby their business. And so they've wound up uh, developing these very large scale production facilities to the point where we're now exporting live reptiles from North America across the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, 11.3 uh, million reptiles were exported. And at the same time, we're bringing other animals in, mostly wild caught, but some from Europe, which are being bred, of uh, 900,000 were imported. So the United States and North America really dominate. Canada is a much smaller player in this because it's much more difficult to move animals back and forth across the border. The American Pet Association reports that this, that household ownership's growing, you know, and is growing faster than other parts of the pet industry, you know, 68% growth. So there's a lot of money in this and a lot of industry that's gearing towards this type of pet ownership. And this brings us to a couple of issues. And I bring up snakes because they're going to be, for the most part, your biggest nightmare. And the reason is that snakes are fueling a lot of the trade in captive bred reptiles. And the big thing is, unlike a dog or cat or horse or um, rats, you can keep really high numbers in very small quarters. And this is what I find a lot of people are surprised to see just exactly what's going on in the industry. This is a normal ball python. To me, this is the most beautiful of the snakes. They're docile. They're, they only get about five feet long. They actually, if you're going to have a snake, make wonderful pets. And the thing with these guys is they're highly variable in some of the genes that they express. So for instance, back in, I think this was 1992, we had Bob Clark produced the first albino. And you can tell it's an albino because of the red eyes. And at the time, that snake would have been about $15,000. Now understand, prior to this, these animals were mostly wild caught and maybe sold for a couple hundred bucks. So all of a sudden, there's money to be made, quite a bit. Then we had the pied ball python, which was going for 1997, it was about $25,000. Uh, that price has now dropped to between five and $700. As a matter of fact, we've already had three of these uh, dumped off in the pet trade for various reasons. Uh, because again, <laughs> people get bored of them. Uh, then Kevin McCurley, who has a massive facility at the New England Reptile uh, Distributors, he produced a what's called a spider ball python. And this is a really interesting pattern change. But the problem with it is, is it actually comes with a neurological deficit called wobblers. So basically you'll see one of these guys and their head shakes like this. And some of it's pretty mild, some of them can be quite severe and they can't eat. And then you started getting people breeding different types of the spider morph to get unusual patterns. And of course, we got the all black, super black pastel, $45,000. Can you see the prices going up? The banana and glow coral, that was uh, starting at $65,000. And this is my favorite. This is an ivory ball python. This is a leucistic snake, basically has black eyes and a white body. And the initial one was worth about $125,000. But it was quickly discovered that if you took two other morphs and bred them together, you could get the ivory color. And that caused a dramatic drop in price of these ones to the point where they're currently running for about 100 bucks. 
and as I said, or 200 bucks. And that was uh, one that uh, I purchased about uh, four years ago. And that's the price then. Now remember, this is what started it all, the normal ball python. And when you're breeding different genetics together, if you're a bad breeder, you wind up producing a lot of normal ball pythons. So these are a byproduct of trying to breed the more interesting animals. So the current normal ball python value is zero. You can't give these things away. Now, some of them have deals with various pet smart chain, or I'm not gonna say it, pet chains to sell these animals because they have excess. So it's pure profit for them because otherwise they'd just be culled. And they're sold to people who don't know what they're doing. So these are probably the most common animal that shows up on my doorstep. In 2018, over 40 of these animals were brought in to do the animal hospital and we euthanized all of them because we couldn't find a place to give them to. Nobody wanted them. We did have one that we were able to rehome. One out of 40. And about six months later, it came back and was euthanized. And remember, this to me is the most beautiful of the ball pythons. And, and what you're gonna have is, you're gonna have people in the reptile industry saying, well, we're breeding these animals, we're taking strain off of the wild caught. No, no, there's still quite a demand for the wild caught because that's the way to bring in new genes. Now here's an interesting story. This is not a ball python, this is a boa. A white leucistic boa, the first one that was ever found. It was actually in a zoo in Brazil and it was owned by a gentleman named Jeremy Stone. The initial offering for these animals was going to be $65,000 per baby. And remember, there's 10 to 20 animals per clutch of eggs. So you could be saying that that snake was worth $1 million. <laughs> Not bad chump change, I'm, I'm going to say. It's like, but unfortunately, it was stolen from that zoo in Brazil. And they pleaded guilty in 2014. And all of the offspring were flown back to Brazil in 2015. <coughs> yeah, I can purchase, currently purchase them for about $5,000. And multiple breeders in the United States have them. Where do you think they came from? This is what you're looking at. This is a ball python breeding facility. The cages in the back are for green tree pythons. But this is how these animals are kept, in drawers, row upon row upon row. There are 1,400 animals in this room alone. And they're getting to the point where they now actively produce the equipment so that you can have these rack systems. Now, don't get me wrong, you can have people breeding animals like this where they're, the animals do great. The places are clean, they're well-maintained, but because of the money involved, there are going to be people who take on this business without a full understanding or full dedication to what needs to be done for these animals. See, the basic principle here is that this is a giant pyramid scheme. This is what you're starting with, an animal with no intrinsic value due to overproduction. But if you do selective breeding, you can produce animals like this. So the value of a new gene is lots and lots of money. So if you hit the genetic jackpot, you can make a lot of money. Now, if it's a dominant gene, meaning that that gene gets passed on to the babies and expresses the new pattern and the new color, you can see that very quickly, after a few generations, the price of that animal drops. But if you have a recessive gene, a gene where you have to take an animal, breed it to 
another animal and then breed its offspring back to the first animal to get that gene to express, all of a sudden that pyramid widens. You make a lot more money. And you see the whole thing about this one? Oh, we're, sorry, we've got a video. <laughs> So we're here at the BC Reptile Association's annual reptile show. We have over 2,500 animals on display, varying from turtles, tortoises, repti uh, reptiles like snakes, lizards, chameleons, basically the full gamut. And the majority of these owners are experienced reptile people. However, you're also going to have a, a, a fair degree of newbies coming in. And this is actually used as a major training event. Almost all of the animals that are here are captive bred animals. And it is the breeding of these animals that's actually causing this industry to expand to the degree that it has. So this whole industry is based on a few breeders at the top making a lot of money, selling to breeders lower down on the pyramid scheme, who then take those animals and breed them, hoping to make a large amount of money, who then sell those animals to people lower down on the pyramid, and so on and so on. The truth is, the only reason that there's value in this is because of a couple of things. It's a cash business so you don't have to declare all your taxes. That would be wrong. Low overhead, especially if you're breeding your own animals and especially if you have ways of cutting costs like, oh, I don't know, maybe attaching your hydro line directly past the little monitoring thing. Oh, there's lots of ways to do it. And there's a constant influx of new rubes, people who think that they too are going to be making massive amounts of money from breeding their pet snakes. There's always people who come up having their little pet ball python and their little crested gecko and coming out saying, boy, I would love to be a reptile breeder. And then they spend $5,000 on a snake that produces just normal ball pythons. Now it's a very specialized market. So this is where the expos are so important. And let's be honest, <laughs> because it's a cash business, it's pretty a good way to launder money if you have to. So what I want to do today, and because a lot of this has already been covered by Alex, I want to talk to you about how to do a reptile inspection, how to work it up. Uh, next one. So what we're trying to do, oh, we got the video started now. This is the story of many of the reptiles and amphibians who were sold at PetSmart and other pet stores. At Reptiles by Mac, a massive exotic animal mill, a PETA eyewitness saw countless animals arrive in tiny containers, sometimes from halfway around the world. These turtles frantically clawed at the side of the crates, desperate to get out. In its two warehouses, Reptiles by Mac kept tens of thousands of animals crammed in filthy, barren plastic tubs, often without adequate food and water. Parched and dehydrated animals clamored for water and drank for several minutes after being given water by PETA's eyewitnesses. Finding emaciated animals was par for the course for PETA's eyewitness, like this bearded dragon, who was desperate for food and water. This is what a healthy bearded dragon should look like. 
countless animals never made it out of Reptiles by Mac alive. PETA's eyewitnesses documented the agonizing deaths and cruel killings of hundreds of animals. Animals who got loose were caught with makeshift glue traps, pieces of cardboard covered with double-sided tape, which weren't checked for several days, leaving them to struggle and die a prolonged death. Others frantically attempted to escape, tearing their skin and dropping their tails as they thrashed around. Bearded dragons were kept in severely crowded tubs and had to fight for food and space, resulting in horrific injuries. Some with nearly severed, infected limbs, exposed bones, and bloody wounds were denied adequate care and often just left to rot. I'd be amazed at how little it's done for the sick ones here. I've cut legs off before, I've had legs before. They didn't budge, and all I had to do was with wire gutters. We're a wholesale distributor, man, so anytime, like, I'm complaining about, you know, the health of, like, a certain animal or, like, one or two animals, I feel like, honestly, in their eyes, it's like, well, if it dies, we'll just die more. You know, we're just pleasing these guys decide to die and waste away. Some reptiles were put in small bags and gassed with carbon dioxide. Workers described animals being thrown into a freezer while they were still alive. It needed to put down a long time ago. Usually I just throw them in a fucking cooler. I've seen them frozen in a freezer, like trying to get out. And this is what it's all for. Thousands of animals were shipped to PetSmart and other stores in crowded containers with no food or water. And Reptiles by Mac is the sixth supplier of pet store chains that PETA has exposed. If you would like to help these animals, please, Go to PETA.org and tell PetSmart that enough is enough and to stop selling all animals. And please, never shop at pet stores that sell any animals. Thank you. So, I do have permission from PETA to use that video, and I do want to point out that some of it is not the way they're claiming it, but most of the conditions that they describe are, as you can see, completely not acceptable. And you will see this very situation occurring with disturbing regularity at a lot of pet stores, a lot of reptile producers, and unfortunately, a lot of rescues. Uh, so how best is it for you to work this up so that you can actually get in front of a judge and, and try and make some changes on this one. And, and this is where it gets challenging. <laughs> so one of the first things I'm gonna be saying is you're going to need a veterinarian. And the reason you're gonna need a veterinarian is because unfortunately, most of the people within this industry are very experienced. And while they will make excuses for it, uh, they're going to say, oh, this is just the way things are done. But by having a veterinarian, preferably one that works with reptiles, but that's not necessarily uh, the, the most important thing, you're going to be able to go in front of a judge and, and show that, no, no, this is not acceptable. And this is where expertise comes in. Uh, this is my Gila monster, by the way. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is it's got a microchip. This is how I can identify it. It's a venomous lizard from the southern United States and is my pride and joy. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we got this going. Sorry, it's being a little slow. So one of the things I oftentimes recommend for your veterinarian that you're working with, grab some textbooks. Uh, these are two, uh, well, they're the same book, first and second, gener or second and third generation, but they will uh, be able to provide your veterinarian with the basics that they can actually go to court and saying, hey, these are the veterinary standards as put forth by the best vets, uh, exotic vets in North America. Cameras are going to be really important. You're gonna to have to document the heck out of this because most lawyers, most judges are going to not understand what you're saying unless you actually have the photos to back up what you're describing. And another one that I really recommend is multicolored tape. Uh, one of the things we find is that you can actually go through a large, because remember some of these 
facilities will have hundreds, not even maybe thousands of reptiles. And you kind of have to organize your time. So what we found was put a little bit of green tape on, okay, yellow tape, let's look at it, red tape, problem, we need to go back and document this one. So these colored tapes are really helpful. I also recommend having a, a, a phone with you so that you can do uh, species identification. You can send pictures to maybe a, an exotics vet that uh, can help you say, okay, look, if this is right or wrong. Uh, it, it's incredibly useful. I hate to say it, to just Google it. It'll give you a lot of good starting information. You're also going to need to have specialized equipment. I strongly urge everyone who does investigations to grab one of these. You can get them for like 25 bucks at, uh, at um, uh, Canadian Tire or other places. It's basically a digital thermometer. Uh, and that way you can take a temperature of the hot spot and the cold spot to determine what the range of temperatures are your animals in. If you just look under the hot spot, you might be missing the fact that the cold side is way too cold or way too hot. Another one that I really like are digital rulers or um, tape measures, uh, especially in a situation where you've got animals that uh, you don't really able to get a tape measure in. This is way you can kind of quickly um, get measurements and safely. And handling tools, snake hooks, uh, tongs, lots of things that you can grab these animals and be, make sure that you remain safe. One of my favorite tools and one that I had to invest in uh, is thermal imaging. Uh, biggest problem is trying to explain to a judge is like, okay, yes, uh, the hot spot's fine, uh, the temp's there, but look how small that hot spot is compared to the size of the animal or animals, especially if you have multiple animals in there. And by having digital thermometer, you can say, look, there's only one area that has enough heat for these animals, the rest of it's way too cold. And you can get the uh, FLIR imaging for your cell phone uh, for under 500 bucks. Now we've talked about housing. Rubbermaid containers are going to be your best bet for transportation. Do remember to bring along duct tape. Two reasons. One, you can use the duct tape to put the hot packs and what you do is you put them on the, t uh, tape them to the roof of the container so that the animal doesn't burn them or dig at them. And you can also use the masking tape to wrap around it so they, they don't escape through little cracks. Do remember air holes. <laughs> uh, they are kind of important. Uh, but other things work like pillowcases, especially for snakes and smaller reptiles. What you do is you put them inside the pillowcase, tie, uh, do a knot, or if you want uh, zip ties, always use two. Um, and that's a great way to secure the animal for transportation. And here's where you're going to get yourself into a slight problem, caging. Uh, most places are not going to have the proper caging for reptiles, so you're going to have to make do. Uh, aquariums, uh, Rubbermaid containers, and again, remember you, this is right now just for short-term housing until you can get them into uh, an enclosure or into a facility that's more designed for them. Um, it's not a bad idea to have at least a few proper reptile cages on hand. Uh, these are PVC cages that uh, Dooney had to purchase due to the sheer volume of reptiles that we've been dealing with over the years. Unfortunately, what you're looking at there is about $10,000 worth of caging. So not a lot of places are gonna have that, but at least have something that you can for just even the occasional animal. Sorry, it's froze for a second. There we go. So you're going to, while doing investigations, going to have a range of housing that you're going to see. Some will have things like on the right where you've just got wooden enclosures. Why? Because it's cheap. Wood is a terrible, terrible medium for keeping reptiles, especially in a pet store or a rescue or any type of place where a large number of animals go through because you cannot sterilize wood. 
So the disease that came in with one animal will then transmit to the next one and the next one and the next one. And it's almost impossible to get rid of parasites like snake mites on these types of enclosures. Aquariums are going to be the other really common one, and the, for most part, they can actually do remarkably well. Um, the downside is, especially if they're tall, it's really hard to get the heat down low enough, and you never want to put the heat lamp in with the snakes. Proper PVC caging, like the one you see in the upper left, and uh, just so you know, that's a two-layer cage, so that lizard actually gets both and access both sides of the cage um, is the best way to go because it conserves heat. It allow it's very good for um, sterilizing, uh, but as I said, it's expensive. And then we go with minimum standards versus recommended. And here's the problem that anybody doing investigations has: what are minimum standards? Well, we don't really have any, and that's a big problem. This is both in Canada and the United States. You know, currently, there's a few ways that you can go. Uh, for instance, there is, in Australia, they've, they have developed some standards. Uh, they were written by the pet industry there and for their benefit. So I consider them an okay starting point, but again, they're really not designed for the animal, but for more, well, more for the benefit of those profiting from these animals. And then there's veterinary standards. And this is why it's so important to have a veterinarian because they can say, no, 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 I'm going with veterinary standards. And that's where the textbooks for Mater, uh, there's also the British Veterinary Medical Association has one that gives you something that you can take in front of a, a, a judge and say, this is appropriate. Unfortunately, as I said, it becomes more of a legal argument than an ethical one, because it really comes down to what can I prove in court? And honestly, the current recommended standards are usually quite a bit larger than even the minimum standards. And there's some research coming out of England that says that at least for a snake, the cage should be at least as long as the snake, so he has the opportunity to stretch out. Unfortunately, that's just not functional in uh, a breeder's facility, so it's just never done. And as I mentioned already, we have uh, two standards in Australia that you can consider using. Uh, they're very similar. And, and they're not bad. I mean, basically what they're saying is that for a three foot long snake, you know, it should be at least 18 by 18. But the weird one is that the government one actually has it a, quite a bit smaller. And the problem with it is, is as you go beyond three feet long, those cages get smaller and smaller to the point where you've got a 10 foot snake in a, like a six foot long cage and it's just not working. This is what Australia thinks is an acceptable cage for a three foot long snake. That's all you need, according to Australia. But we're not in Australia. So veterinary standards. And this is why I said I like Mater. And by the way, this is an actual enclosure that we had somebody bring their snake in. <laughs> it was like, uh, the snake was like three feet long and the cage was like 18 inches by eight. It's ridiculous. So if you go to the second edition of Mater, and this is kind of the one that you'll see the textbook that probably you can still use, though the third edition's actually made it a little bit larger, is that a lizard should at least have the length, three times the length of the animal, two times their width, and if it's an arboreal one, you have to have two to three times the height. Turtles, five times the length, three times their width, and at least half of the animal's length and water depth, so it can go up and down. And tortoises, five times. Uh, that's not a very big area, honestly, if you're having a large tortoise. It's about a third of the size of the enclosure that I have my tortoises in. The easiest one for you to use, one that's simple, that you can take in front of a judge, is the L technique. That the length of the snake should equal the length of the cage plus the width of the cage. So if you have an eight foot snake, it needs a, at least a six foot by two foot cage. Six feet long plus two feet width equals eight feet. 
uh, that's rare that you're actually going to see that in the larger snakes, but it gives you something to aim for. This is going to be the most common one that you're going to see, the rack systems. And this is a 23 by 16 by 6 inch one. And that's for an adult ball python. Personally, for an animal that gets up to five, six feet, that's to me too small. Uh, but for the smaller animals, you were, are going to see that quite often. One of the things that you really want to look for when you're doing these investigations are thermostats. These are basically ways to keep the temperature exactly where you want to be. So if you're going to an inspection and they don't have thermostats, I'd be strongly suggesting that they get one. And that's actually essential for some of the heating sources that we're going to see in a bit. This is what you're going to most commonly see, which are these um, Zillow thermostats. Uh, they work. Uh, they're not very accurate. Uh, they break down pretty quickly, but they're cheap. And this is what you'll most commonly see, which is just a dimmer switch, which they've just wired into their heating pads. And yeah, it's a major, major problem for uh, um, burns. This is how most of these facilities will heat their enclosures, a series of heat tape uh, that are um, you run in series. So all of them uh, are on the same thermostat and they all are equally on the same temperature. Uh, they run in series, they're affordable. They're not the cheapest thing on there, but they work. And again, you're gonna see that most commonly. You're going to see this because reptile people are cheap. And basically they take heating wire that's supposed to be underneath a underneath your ceramic floors uh, and these things generate a huge amount of heat and so yeah you see a lot of burns with them and never should be done but unfortunately you are going to see it and this is what you'll occasionally see and it's a huge red flag which are heating pads these are the ones that you buy at your local drugstore they're a major fire hazard because people put them they get cramped underneath the cages, they, the wires get crimped, uh, they generate too much heat, they break down if there's any moisture in the environment, and then they can cause thermal burns. This is what I recommend for most people. They're expensive, but they're great. They provide heat from above, which if you think about it, that's where these animals are getting their heat from, from the sun. It's controllable with the thermostat because there's no direct contact, the risk of burns are low. And yes, thermal burns. You're gonna to have to pick up those snakes and look at their bellies because you're gonna see this with some degree of regularity. Then of course, good old heat lamps, incandescent bulbs. They're cheap. The only thing is, is you need a guard to protect them so that the animal can't touch them, which you'll never see. <coughs> now we, Alex brought up a bunch of things with UV lights and oh yeah, they need it. Um, they, there's nothing in the research that says that uh, you have, um, uh, that you can give them vitamin D orally and that you, by doing that, you can not have UV lights. So there's a lot of studies out there and there's really no good evidence to say that it works. The other thing you're going to see people doing is UV bulbs, but then they'll have something like glass over it and that completely blocks UV light, so it doesn't work. And these are produced by mercury vapor bulbs and fluorescent bulbs, and they're expensive bulbs. So one of the things that I talk to people about is, if you're going to be doing these investigations, spend your money, get a good UV monitor. Uh, I picked this one up for about 250 bucks on Amazon, uh, 225. Uh, it's working way, way better. Because the thing is, is most of the places that have UV bulbs, they're supposed to be replaced every six months, but they never do it. Oftentimes, they'll just use normal UV bulbs, hoping that you won't know any better. And so you should be able to at least put these things up against the um, bulb and, and get some UV light. And sometimes you'll see them using like uh, black lights that you use for like, uh, um, you know, dancing, but those, those are dangerous. They, they'll actually injure the animal. Uh, there is a, a UV checker, smart UV checker on Amazon uh, for 32 bucks. 
I did purchase it. I thought it was working really well, but then I started testing it on some of my UV bulbs and it just doesn't work where this one does. So I don't recommend that smart UV checker anymore. So here's some things that you need to be looking for when you're doing these investigations. Lack of water, overcrowding. Reptiles are not social. There should be, for the most part, one bearded dragon per tank, not 20. You should never see mixing of species. Zoos have a hard time doing it. You think some twit in his house knows how to mix different species from different parts of the world who have different humidity requirements, different temperature requirements? No, but they'll do it. And you also want to make sure that the housing, the temperature, the UV light, the moisture is appropriate. You're going to find that a lot of them aren't. You're going to have a lot of medical concerns. A lot of these places, uh, pet stores, especially the ones that are devoted to reptiles, but also uh, the rescues, which are oftentimes hoarding situations, <clears throat> and breeding facilities, oftentimes get lazy. So they'll mix animals together, they'll feed live, and you're going to see injuries because of the way that they do these. I recommend on any animals that you bring in, do a fecal flow, look closely for external parasites because things like snake mites will transmit very quickly and are very hard to get rid of. And look for vet records. They never have them. I, I know that. They will say that they do records and they'll say the records are off site, but they don't have any. But records are a really good indication that the facility that you're dealing with is on the up and up. Now, you've got to be aware of some of the diseases that are out there. Snake fungus. <clears throat> For those of you in the East Coast, this is a fungal disease that is going to become more and more prevalent over the next few years. It's a death sentence. On the West Coast, uh, it is in Ontario. It's in the Massasauga rattlesnakes there. It's done some pretty significant damage. On the West Coast, there's only one facility in all of uh, the West Coast that has been identified. Uh, <clears throat> and that facility sells mice and boards animals. So I don't know how prevalent it is around here. I see it. I haven't seen it out off of that facility, but I'm waiting for it. Inclusion body disease. <sighs> Inclusion body disease is a viral disease that is more prevalent in the pet trade than people give it credit for. Um, very few people are doing the appropriate tests for it, uh, but it is contagious and it will kill large numbers of pythons. So if you do have any significant deaths, make sure that you have a pathologist look for this disease. And this is what you'll see. You'll see them rolling. It causes neurological problems, but also vomiting. Uh, and it's, as I said, it's a, it's a death sentence. Chytrid fungus. This is way more common in the pet trade than people realize. Uh, we've done several uh, animals test positive here from the pet trade and Given its ability to devastate our native species, if you have any dead frogs, make sure you get them tested for that. And if it's positive, I'd strongly recommend it depopulating. We've had it confirmed here in British Columbia on cytology, unconfirmed on DNA, but it's an issue. And ranavirus, which is a virus that uh, is uh, found in box turtles and frogs. Uh, it is in the pet trade. We had one here that uh, made my tortoises, the one that you were sick, saw incredibly ill. We had to put them on antiviral therapy, and it was three months of just barely surviving and killed off a bunch of my frogs. So it's also something you're going to see in these animals. And yellow fungus most commonly found on bearded dragons, but it can affect most reptiles. So if you have any animals with very thick yellowish dyskesia, dried uh, flaky uh, uh, scales, sheds, uh, it's worth having it tested so that you're not spreading it through your facility. Now, here are some of the animals were surrendered to me, so you've got an idea of the stuff that we're going to be dealing with. 
the previous owner maintains that these animals are all 110% healthy. Uh, this is a frilled dragon with severe mite infection, fungal infection. Uh, this was, as I said, 110% healthy. As you can see, it is not. This is what they're supposed to look like. This is a leopard gecko. Very common that you're going to see these leopard geckos with eye caps. Um, a lot of uh, places to avoid a veterinary visit will clean them out themselves. Uh, they should not be because it's very easy to injure the eye and just make things worse. Uh, but as I said, this is an animal that was 110% healthy. And this is a, an iguana that uh, had a piece of fabric wrapped around its leg for months. Uh, bite wounds all over the place. Uh, these were a bunch of iguanas kept together, which you never do because iguanas will, are, are during the breeding season, will kill each other. That's what they do. And in enclosed in facilities, there's no way for them to get away from each other. Cohabbing is not your friend. And yellow fungus, there's a, a, that was one that was, as I mentioned before, uh, was found also, usually most commonly on bearded dragons, but as you can see, is also found um, in other species. And of course, this perfectly 110% healthy chameleon suffering from severe dehydration. So inspection tips, oh, we went way through there. Hold on a second, let's go back there. So here's some tips for you when you're doing an inspection. And remember, I talked a little bit about, you know, using those um, pieces of tape. You can use those tape to determine um, which ones you find that have no water, the cage is too small. And, and by just going through the entire facility and putting little sticker tapes on there, you can really quickly go through an, an entire facility and then just have somebody come along and actually write down the numbers. And what you'll find is that using statistics, you can actually determine that say 60% of them have no water, 60% of the cages are too small, 40% have medical problems. And again, very useful information to be able to show in front of a judge. Excuse me, what you're trying to show is that this isn't an individual animal that's missing water. It's a large number of animals that are missing water. And they're gonna tell you all oh, the animals um, spilled it or, or things along those lines. Honestly, we've done multiple testings on different temperatures in our facility here, places with high heat, low heat, and water bowls do not conduct heat well. And there's very little movement of the surface area. So it takes at least a week to 10 days for these water bowls to empty. Mm -hmm. So when they're saying that, oh yeah, no, the snake was uh, drank it all or knocked it over, they're lying to you, especially if it's, it's okay if you have one or two animals, but when you get 60%, no. And you're gonna see crowding, overcrowding. This is a uh, one that um, had multiple snakes in an enclosure that was already too small. You really need to have at least uh, a 20% increase in the size of the enclosure per animal. And again, the, at least the minimum has to already <laughs> be appropriate for one animal, let alone two. But again, uh, cohabbing is gonna be a problem. One of the interesting things that I, uh, one of the pointers that I find work really well is when you're going into an investigation on any of these, it's a good idea to bring a thermometer and look for a large pond or any type of body of water, even a bucket. And the reason is, is if you take the thermometer and you put it in that bucket and it says 60 degrees, that only way for that water to become that cold is either they've got a really expensive chiller unit, which are $5,000 and they'll be able to show you it, or more likely they turn the heat off at night. This is how reptile facilities save money. They turn the heat off at night, sometimes have the heat bulbs going, but that's the only way for those, and understand there's never enough heat lamps for all of the animals that are, are put in with these animals. So that's the way that they save money. 
Is it ethical? No. Is it moral? No. But is it financially in their interest? Yes. But by looking at that body of water, the large one, you can go to a judge and said, look, judge, <laughs> this facility gets down to 60 degrees or even colder. So that's one thing to do when you're inspecting in the middle of January. And don't forget the food. Here's one of the things that oftentimes people forget when inspecting reptiles. They'll look at all of the reptiles, but they won't look at the mice and the rats that they're using as food. And the rats and mice deserve equal care. Make sure they have sufficient food, water, and space. Make sure it's rat food and not dog kibble. Look for inter-animal aggression. Are they fighting? It's a good indication that they're fighting over space or water or places to hide. Look for pneumonia, mycoplasma. Take a, sacrifice one or two of them and have their lungs, lungs inspected. And understand that rats and mice need cooler temperatures. So if you're in a reptile facility where the temperatures are in the upper 80s, it's too hot for the mice. And of course, understand that live feeding of rats and mice is unethical. And if they're telling you that's the only thing animals will eat, they're lying to you. So how do you humanely kill these animals? Well, cervical dislocation, and I'm gonna apologize, but basically you take the rat by the tail and you swing it against a corner of a table and that breaks the neck and then you crack it. It is an acceptable method. The other one is CO2 carbon dioxide. Not vinegar and baking soda that a lot of places will use, but an actual tank of carbon dioxide with a regulator valve so that you have consistent amount of carbon dioxide being put into that enclosure. Because if you don't, those rats die a horrible and painful death. Another trick, water-soluble pens. They're non-toxic. They're just Find marker pen, just make a little mark above the water line and then visit again in one or two weeks. If the bowls have been water filled with water or cleaned, the mark will be gone. If it's still there, you know they're lying to you. Dot labels, I love these. Place a dot on one of the fluorescent bulbs. When you come back six or seven months to reinspect, if that dot label's there, then you know they didn't replace it. They're supposed to replace them every six months. They lie to you. Oh, well, we've already, sorry, we've already gone through this one already. Um, oh yeah, I, I should mention, as I said, I mentioned the CO2 regulator, but uh, one of the other ones is, look at the actual uh, container that they use their gas. Because some of them don't use carbon dioxide, they use propane or welding gas, which is not acceptable. Nitrogen is another one you'll commonly see. No, nitrogen is no longer acceptable. And as I said, I mentioned sacrificing a few of them and looking at the lungs. The upper left is what a normal rat lung should look like, nice and pink, salmon pink. So you get into moderate plasma, uh, mycoplasmosis or pneumonia, it'll be like the bottom left where you start to see a lot more hemorrhaging, a lot more redness, a lot more inflammation. And then on the right, you see severe mycoplasmosis and these animals need to be humanely euthanized. Almost all your rats are gonna have some degree of mycoplasmosis, uh, it's just it's getting worse and worse. And, and th that concludes it. Uh, so if you do have any questions, uh, I'm more than welcome to answer them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Walton. Great presentation. I should say that uh, after hearing you give so, uh, some of the tips that you covered is, is, um, as well as other new ones that you've given in this presentation that I've actually went out and purchased some of these equipment, this equipment and it's been uh, extremely useful. Uh, I'll start off, off the questions. Um, I'm wondering about, and I know you've got a background in fish. If you've got uh, somebody who's enforcement that wants to go in and inspect fish, but they don't know a lot, what, what advice would you give to them going into a pet store looking at fish? 
Sure. Well, a couple of things that you should be looking for is what their net dip is. Um, you'll oftentimes see where they collect the, di the nets and they should be having something like malachite green or methylene blue if they can still get it, or at least ask them what they're using as their net dip, because that's how disease is transmitted. The other one is look for the uh, garbage can in the back, because all of the morts, the dead fish, will be taken back there. Um, and so you can kind of get a sense of the numbers. One of the biggest problems we're currently having in Canada is that uh, most of the pharmaceutical drugs that are uh, antibiotics that were commonly used in fish are no longer available. So you do want to take a look and see if they're using anything like uh, these medications that you get from Russia or China, uh, because again, it's a big problem for, uh, for the use of uh, antibiotic resistance if they're using drugs like Batril or metronidazole. So take a look at the medications. Uh, the other one is, you know, take some very good quality photos of any sick looking fish. You'll oftentimes see them at the bottom or um, you'll see uh, them kind of floating at the top in the back corner. And then you can send them to your local zoo or if you have an aquarium and they can kind of give you some pointers on that one. And again, you, you know, you want to look for diseases like ick, which is little white spots all over them, um, as well as tail fungus. And those are the most common ones. Understand that most of the fish that you are seeing, if you are dealing with freshwater, are captive bred animals, mostly from Florida, but also from Southeast Asia. China, Hong Kong has a huge goldfish market there. Um, but all of the saltwater ones, with the exception of a few clownfish, are captured in the wild. And so the mortality rate of saltwater fish, and I know this from my, my master's thesis, is approximately 80%. In other words, for every fish that you get in, uh, you know, five died or four died. Um, so it's something to uh, be aware of when you're doing these inspections. But honestly, it comes down to knowledge. Talk to the people, see if they understand you know, what are the requirements for heat? What are the requirements for water hardness? And if they don't know what they're talking about, you got some problems. Okay, uh, we have a question uh, that's come in through the system. Is there a registry or accreditation organization for rescues that are reputable? Uh, <laughs> and and uh, as well, how does a shelter, who, uh, who I'm presuming the person who asked the question is saying it from the perspective of not having a lot of knowledge. How does a shelter that wants to send exotic animals or reptiles to uh, uh, a sanctuary or a rescue know that they're not sending those animals to a bad place? Most of them are. Um, the problem with reptiles is the animals that are coming into you are not the valuable ones. They are the normal ball pythons, the normal bearded dragons, the normal red-eared sliders, which I hate to tell you this, nobody wants them. You can't rehome these animals because nobody wants the, the boring ones. So for every, and this is the biggest problem we have is that you have rescues that take animals in and they reach a point where more animals are coming in than going out. And one of two things happens. Either they say, no, we can't accept them anymore. Or second, they say, okay, well, because there's nowhere else for them to go and they'll otherwise die, we'll cram them in. And at some point you get to the point where there's putting so many new animals together that the death rate is so high that they can still take in animals and they think they're just, these animals are just dying naturally, even though they should live 15, 20 years, they only live six months. And what they don't realize it's because of their housing. So you really need to do inspections of these rescue facilities. The, with reptiles especially, rescue and hoarding are pretty well, very close to being the exact same thing. Um, the biggest, the biggest uh, one I'd be saying is if you have a rescue that says, I can't accept anything because we're full, that's a rescue I trust. If they're saying, no, we can't, then they better have a good euthanasia policy because eventually they're going to get full. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, a lot of industries um, use, and this is 
sometimes articulated right into laws and regulations that generally accepted practices um, uh, are, are fine. And, uh, you know, you see this with agricultural animals and I think uh, dogs and, and, and certainly I've heard that with, with reptiles that sort of this is what everybody does, this is what the industry does, so it's fine. So the question is, uh, how do we get reasonable standards of care that can be used uh, as references for accepted practices? And that's our problem, we don't. Uh, in Canada, we have uh, the Canadian, um, sorry, the Canadian Council of Animal Care Committee is working up a one for reptiles as we speak. Uh, that'll have some basics for you. But what it comes down to is having a veterinarian stand in front of a judge and say, these are the minimum standards of the veterinary uh, veterinarians who deal with these reptiles. Just because this is what's been standard practice doesn't mean that it's right. And there's, a, there's enough research out there now that you can, this is why I said you need a veterinarian. You can, you, you'll still be able to stand up in front of a judge and say, well, this is the minimum standards of the veterinary association. I'm a veterinarian and this is what I have to go with. And then it's up to the plaintiff to be able to convince a judge that cramming 20 snakes into a Rubbermaid bin is stand, uh, stand, industry standard. Okay. Uh, we've got time for one more question. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Walton will have access to the questions he can answer uh, after his presentation, but we do have to move on. So I'll just finish with one more question. Uh, do, you, do you think or do you have knowledge of any jurisdiction in Canada that currently has adequate uh, inspection and investigation regimes for these species? I assume they probably mean reptiles. Yeah, no. Um, I will say probably the two places that do it the best is Alberta and British Columbia. Um, Alberta has now had uh, two large-scale seizures and they've actually had to uh, and they've actually gone to court over it. And so they've, they've started to develop some decent practices. And British Columbia, um, I, I, will, I, I give major kudos to the BCSPCA in that a lot of jurisdictions don't want to deal with these types of cases versus the uh, BCSPCA that have actually gone ahead and said, okay, we're responsible for these animals too. We're going to deal with it. Um, and we've actually had in British Columbia at least one criminal case that went forward on animal cruelty of reptiles due to somebody in Nanaimo, which the conditions were absolutely horrible. Um, we're stymied, uh, and this is the same issue across the entire country, in getting prosecutors willing to take these cases on for various reasons. Um, it is a challenge to take on these cases. I fully uh, give kudos to any jurisdiction that puts it forward. But as I say, until you actually get prosecutors willing to pursue these cases, and I, again, I'm gonna remind everybody with COVID, you're gonna have a lot of these places going belly up in the next six months. So be prepared ahead of time because uh, you're going to be dealing with these. So it really kind of comes down to the individual jurisdiction and whether they're willing to, whether your prosecutors are willing to deal with it. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. We're out of time. Uh, but like uh, I said, if anyone has questions, they can send them in and uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to answer them. Uh, we're going to do a reduced uh, break because we're running a little bit behind. So we're going to uh, reconvene in five minutes uh, on the nose for the last presentation by Dr. Neil DeCruz. So just five minutes from now, that's at 2.31. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to uh, reconvene now for the remainder of this webinar session. And uh, this is a presentation I've uh, been looking forward to hearing. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Neil DeCruz, who's Head of Wildlife Research at World Animal Protection. And I've certainly heard of Dr. DeCruz, but never had the pleasure of actually meeting him. Uh, Neil is a wildlife researcher interested in a range of conservation and animal welfare topics. Uh, through his research, he has been involved in addressing a wide range of complex issues, including wildlife farming, human wildlife conflict, and various aspects of the wildlife trade. During his career, Neil has lived, worked, and traveled in over 40 countries across six continents and has published over 60 peer-reviewed scientific articles. As a trained taxonomist with a particular passion for herpetology, he has also helped to discover and describe six new species previously unknown to science. Uh, in 2014, he joined the Wild Crew, which is the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit at the University of Oxford as a visiting academic. Uh, his presentation title today is Assessing Animal Welfare at Exotic Pet Expos, Ball Pythons as a Case Study. And for those of us watching from here in Canada or the United States, uh, we're probably familiar with pet expos and reptile expos and uh, Certainly uh, from us here in Canada who are looking at these issues, um, it's a growing problem uh, for animal welfare. So without any further ado, I want to uh, turn the screen over to Dr. Niels, Neil uh, de Cruz. And uh, like I said, I'm looking forward to this presentation and I'm sure uh, after hearing it, you'll be glad that you saw it as well. So we'll turn the screen over now. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, and um, yeah, just to just to build on it, really. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky that I've been uh, affiliated now with World Animal Protection for for over 14 years, uh, working on animal wel welfare issues um, on, a, on a kind of global scale. But um, I'm also very fortunate that I have spent um, lots of time um, in the in the natural habitats of uh, of some of the animals. Um, that have been talked about today, in particular long spells in Madagascar and South Africa, where I've um, really had the opportunity to, to see the animals in the natural habitat and to, to also see how the wildlife trade chain functions right from, from the source all the way up, up to, uh, to um, consuming countries or, or, or the sink. So um, what I'm hoping to do today is, is to use ball pythons as a case study and really build on the, the two previous fantastic um, talks to, to really demonstrate how um, it is possible to assess animal welfare using environmental conditions as a, as a proxy um, to a level with, with really minimal equipment um, to a level that you can actually take this in and get it to a peer reviewed study and really raise attention to the animal welfare issues and the scope and scale of, of issues that may be prevalent um, in a particular captive environment, in this case, the, um, the exotic pet expo. So um, um, just to start off, um, just to highlight, um, as with what is an exotic animal that was talked about earlier, there are a range of different um, working definitions of what animal welfare is. Um, so what I thought would be useful from the outset is just to kind of highlight um, and draw attention really to the, to the definition that I'm going to be kind of operating off today, so to speak. Um, and this is one that was um, previously put out by the World Animal Health Organization or the OIE. <clears throat> and um, just to read this out, um, animal welfare means how an animal is coping with the condition in which it lives. Uh, an animal is in a good state of welfare if, as indicated by scientific evidence, it is healthy, comfortable, well-nourished, safe, able to express innate behavior, and it is not suffering from unpleasant states such as pain, fear and distress. Uh, animal welfare refers to the state of the animal. The treat that the animal receives is covered by other terms such as animal care, animal husbandry and, and humane treatment. So um, as I said, definitions do vary, but um, this is the one we'll operate off um, here today. Um, and so how can it be assessed? Well, to, to really um, 
again, understand good welfare and captive animals, we have to find a way to assess and measure um, animal welfare. And this isn't always an easy task um, because of, of different species and their various um, varying needs, as you've heard in the previous two talks, um, as well as the consideration of, of the individual animal itself. There can be a huge range um, in how an animal is able to cope with certain captive conditions based on that individual, let alone um, species differences. You know, just as just as, as um, I think would be more readily observed in dogs or cats. Um, you know, specific personalities come come through. Um, but uh, a particularly useful tool that's come through in, in recent years uh, in terms of a science based assessment of animal welfare um, is one that's really benefited from the five domains model of potential welfare compromise, um, which which really is is broken down as, as this diagram hopefully um, shows. The, the physical functional domains, um, so um, nutrition, what the animal is gaining in that um, respect, um, the environment which it's living in, its physical health and also its behaviour. And these, these can all have positive or, or negative states, um, you know, um, in terms of, um, for example, um, you can have a really enriched environment or you can have a very barren environment to, to kind of give a simplistic um, example. And what all this also um, kind of contributes to is, is what has uh, been recognised, which is the, the fifth um, domain, which is the mental domain. And again, there are negative and positive experiences that are expressed, um, you know, from, from positive experiences being, uh, you know, um, happiness, negative experiences being, being uh, anxiety. And all of this contributes to, to um, going back to the previous slide, um, you know, in our definition there, the overall welfare status. Of, of the animal. So, um, oops, sorry, skipped across there. Um, so, um, with this in mind, kind of implementing management te techniques and standards that promote good and positive physical and mental health every species. Um, in, and you're also trying to prevent as much as possible the unpleasant experiences that the animal is, is experiencing. Um, personally, I, again, as has been highlighted earlier today, um, you know, it really is from from my experience of, of being in the field and seeing how how these animals will, in many cases, will live. There really is only ever going to be a poor substitute um, for the range and the diversity of experiences that the animal would have in the wild, from its diet to enrichment to to um, space. But um, but again, it's really about trying to to min you know minimize that once the animal in, is in captivity in terms of the restrictions that's, that's posed to it. So um, a, a nice example that I've seen used in the past I've got here as an example is is almost like a hierarchy of needs um, example where here you've got this this tree going up the roots uh, represent the critical foundational requirements the animal needs so veterinary care making sure that the disease free their injuries are treated there's proper nutrition um, that they've got shelter, clean water, sanitary living conditions. That's a kind of kind of um, critical um, level of care that's needed. We are going above and beyond and making sure that the animal's having a really positive experience as much as possible is when you do start thinking about mental stimulation, choice, which is an important thing that will be highlighted later, social needs, and, and basically just contributes to the wellness and well-being of the animal. So I quite like that, that, that kind of metaphor of the tree there with the crown being the most varied and complex welfare related activities and the roots being the critical foundation requirements. And um, so um, what's um, a huge problem is actually, as you've again heard today, is how you can actually go about um, really getting a, a good feel and understanding for the welfare conditions of an animal in a captive environment. and. Um, Exotic pet expos, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, are, are becoming extremely popular. Um, they're also becoming a globalised phenomenon, so not just happening um, in, um, in North America and, and in Europe, but also starting to pop up elsewhere. And there, there is a fundamental part there about globalisation, increasing wealth and um, access, um, and this boom that really has, has um, continued to flourish since the 1990s. Um, and of course, although um, you know, this is usually born and typically born out of an affinity for wildlife and a desire to to have close proximity to animals and to take good care of them. 
unfortunately it does come with with quite significant and increasingly um scary um you know conservation public health animal rights and animal welfare concerns um but really there's been a bit of a, a dearth of um research that's really looked on the latter the animal welfare impacts that we're discussing today um in terms of published um, scientific um, literature and there's a there's a lot of reasons for that and you know one of the just to, to give you some of the constraints or challenges that are faced um this as you can see from this image there can be in some scenarios lots of people um there can be lots of different animals um in terms of number but also in terms of diversity of species um, there can be not a lot of time to really to really do a full sweep of a of a facility or an, an expo like this, and to um, to document what's what's going on. You can have potentially reluctant vendors or or um, hosting um, venues that just don't want um, to um, to enable that kind of assessment to take place. Um, and again, you know, what you, what you can have is. Um, you know, it can have to be really difficult to have access to the animals themselves either to do behavior observations which i'll discuss a little bit later or, or physical health examinations as you've heard about but um but as i said there are um despite these challenges there are ways that you can design assessments that use animal care as a, as a proxy uh, i'm going to walk, walk you through some of the thought processes processes that we went through um, when we developed um, what we believe is the largest study of its kind uh, focused on the single species being sold at pet expos um, and, and and how we took that um, that approach and that data and and got it to um, a peer-reviewed scientific paper and and which we hope is going to um, have a positive impact uh, for the welfare of snakes in the long term so um just to go back to our our chosen um case study species which you've heard a bit about already um you know we we did choose this species predominantly because it is generally considered to be the most common or popular species of reptile that is that is available on the market <clears throat> um, and we thought it would be an ideal candidate because it's a species that would enable us to get a snapshot of the animal care that was being provided at, at these these types of events um, it is their small size and their relatively docile nature that makes them particularly popular um, and um, I would I would say kind of inappropriately um, perceived as a, as a good starter pet um, and they are they are popular due to a misconception that they require little uh, relatively little specialized care in addition to the color color morphs and variations which which again we'll, we'll, we'll touch on again um, soon So, in so, um, just coming back to sourcing, um, I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, so, just going back to sourcing, um, um, this species of snake um, is um, is protected um, internationally under the Convention of the International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, um, CITES. Um, and um, it is essentially, it has the dubious honour of being uh, the, mo the single most exported wild animal from the, the African continent globally under that international treaty. Um, over three million individual bull pythons have been exported from, from West Africa, predominantly three countries, um, since records first began in the kind of mid 1970s, um, and annual exports peaked uh, at around 250,000 in 2005. But even since then, um, there have been around 100,000 coming in every year after that. So, and, and, and as I mentioned, these are all coming from three countries really in West Africa: Togo, Benin, and Ghana. Um, and this is all based on. Um, on a process that's um, that's got the, the the technical term that's te you know usually used is, is ranching, whereby the um, the hunters will go out and collect gravid females or collect the eggs. Will bring them to a holding facility, um, typically called a snake farm, uh, and when the eggs are hatched, um, a proportion of of um, the animals will then be exported and shipped 
internationally with the, the vast majority going to the US and the EU um, for, for captive breeding. Um, but there is a proportion that's put back into the wild. So usually around 10 to 20% is, is what is uh, reported. Um, there are concerns, particularly uh, around a lack of data uh, and, uh, and, and whether or not this is an effective conservation model when you have things like genetic pollution and reintroduction of diseases and whether the quotas and the, um, the numbers are, that uh, are required are actually being followed. But um, that's, that's probably best saved for a, another talk at another time. The main here, thing here is just to, again, which was, which was mentioned earlier, is to highlight that even now there are huge numbers of, um, relatively speaking, of these snakes coming in um, and, and going globally uh, from these, these source countries. Um, so, yeah, this is indeed being, uh, is taking place to um, support uh, and bring in new genetic material for, for the captive breeding um, industry, which has, has um, flourished um, subsequently. Um, so, you know, here's just an example of the slide here where you've just got a, a snapshot of the range of different color morphs or phenotypes that are that are possible as a result of the selective um, artificial breeding um, and yeah there are there are some pretty significant animal welfare concerns um, with this type of of um, speed breeding um, in particular you have things like um, duck bills which um, will be a, a huge problem for for some of the animals um, in terms of of them being able to feed um, this is um this is also an issue with was has been mentioned earlier with the the, the term wobble heads or, or wobble syndrome which again is that genetic um defect which which is essential neurological disorder which um it causes the head to wobble so much that it does cause so much issues and and, and difficulties with the animal feeding um, you also also have issues such as um, uh, bug eyes, as you can see in this uh, this individual here, um, which again just just comes from um, trying to to breed that particular special colour morph that will that will make um, the maximum amount of dollars for the for the vendor or the breeder. And you also have things um, like spinal kinks as well. That can um, can cause real issues with the um, with, with the animals themselves. So um, a major problem is that um, unfortunately, all too often reptiles aren't um, recognised um, as being sentient. That is, they you know having the ability to feel um, emotions and be capable uh, of doing that. Um, so um, you know historically they have been misunderstood by many people and they are subject to misconceptions. But um, you know we've um, we ourselves as part of our research team we've reviewed recently the scientific literature, you know um, hundreds of scientific papers, and and you know it, it is widely accepted in the scientific literature that they are sentient and they can feel both positive and negative emotions um, relating to the animal welfare aspects that we talked about earlier. Um, but, you know, because their biology is so different from, from say, dogs or cats and, and other mammals, we humans do tend to relate to them, to them less. Um, and so it, it may be partly due to this that uh, often there is kind of accepted perception that they don't require a lot of care uh, or, or um, specialised attention. Um, and um, that they may not need space or, or stimulating environments compared to other categories of pets. So, um, but yeah, you know, um, you could um, look into, um, ideally, you would, if you had all the time in the world and access, um, you would be looking into things like behaviour and emotional states of the animals when they're at exposed. So things like interaction with transparent boundaries, where they all keep um, budding against the, the, plexi, the plexiglass of the, the container, hyperactivity, um, head hiding to investigate uh, behavioral aspects such as anxiety. But, um, but yeah, you, you typically need um, 
a lot of time to painstakingly observe the animals in control and non-control conditions uh, over long periods of time and with, with, with large sample numbers and so lots of lots of different snakes um, and that's a luxury that's not typically afforded um, at a busy and bustling, bustling um, pet expo. Um, the other thing you could do um, as has been mentioned uh, today is you could look into the physical concern so you could physically examine if you have if you have a veterinarian with your team um distress and injury um that may be um may be associated uh, all the animals may be suffering and again you know ahead of our research we did some quite extensive literature reviews and we found um that there weren't too many papers actually published on on this particular species which was a bit of a surprise um, given its um you know given its prominence and uh, in the wildlife trade uh, and its dubious Honor of being the most um, exported um, snake undersites. But in the papers that we did come across, we found nearly 150 underlying pathogens that had been reported. So that's different types of, uh, of fungi, of bacteria, of viruses, um, um, of, of parasites that these animals um, can, can endure in captivity. And also um, around 100 clinical symptoms and, and diseases that are, are, are are associated with them and um yeah uh, again just to summarize bull pythons in particular are particularly prone to mouth and respiratory infections external parasites so particularly ticks uh, and genetic defects and conditions as a result of the of the um the breeding that we've mentioned earlier today so just to go back to how we um you know Given that the, the difficulties in, in not being able to, um, in, in this instance, have direct access to all of the different animals to do those kind of physical checks and not have the ability to, to observe their behaviour um, or, or follow up on their emotional states, um, we, we started to um, kind of scratch our heads and think about how else we could go about um, really delving into what the animal welfare conditions were and, and, and how we could communicate them across. Um, to, to key interested stakeholders that might lead to positive change. And um, what we first decided to do was really explore the natural history of the animals and just to delve into that. Um, and again, interestingly, the amount of information really was sparse compared to what we thought might be out there, given the, the decades of trade that had gone on. But um, what was quickly apparent is that um, this is... Um, uh, a species that's um, typically found in kind of grassland habitat. It's um, it's a crepuscular, a crepuscular species, so it's highly active um, very early in the morning and, and kind of in the late late evening dusk kind of time. And um, they they shelter in burrows, so they will take advantage of rodent um, rodent burrows that have been created. Um, they um, they but they do come out and kind of climb trees at night on occasion. They feed on on a range of birds and, and rodents, and um, in these burrows they will they will curl around and will will, will incubate their eggs, um, and show a, show a degree of kind of parental care over the egg clutch, um, and their name um, the ball python um, is purportedly from the fact that um, they um, they have this defensive mechanism which is they do ball up and will hide the hen in this this kind of ball up of curled and coils um, when they are when they feel threatened by a, by a predator. So we, we kind of took all this into account. Um, and we then started to look into any, um, and this has been discussed, but like kind of the minimum care guidance and the minimum standards that really need to be um, followed, irrespective of legal, um, legal aspects, which can vary on a state, um, on a country level. Um, and where we landed was on, on some guidance that was provided by the RSPCA, uh, the Royal Society of the Prevention of, of, uh, Royal Society of the Prevention of the Cruelty to Animals here in, um, here in the UK. And what we, um, what we came across was, a, was a, the husbandry guidelines that they had. Um, and we picked out some key aspects that we felt would be very useful for designing um, assessment criteria that we could follow up on. And um, a quick summary here are um, these snakes are, are known to feed every five to six days. So they don't require the food every day. Um, 
uh, when they have eaten, you should really be looking at avoiding handling for around 48 hours. When you do handle them, it should be for about 20 minutes maximum. Um, the water is required not only for drinking, but ideally the animal should have the choice or the ability to go and submerge itself fully um, in terms of, of cleaning in a, in a bowl of water. Um, waste, so droppings will usually come within, within days of, of consuming food. Um, there is an element of, of, of requirement for shelter, um, you know, being um, able to, to, um, to, to have that kind of duck and cover and, and the, the, the sense of security that comes with that. And also, um, again, going back to earlier, what was discussed, the ability for, for space and mobility, and in particular, increasingly the evidence is showing that snakes really do, including ball pythons, really do need this ability to stretch out their full length um, when, they, when they feel necessary, even the species that is known to, um, to spend um, time in, in, in burrows such as this. So taking an armed of all of this, this knowledge, um, we did set us about um, um, looking into study design. Um, and, and we um, first thought it would be very useful to, um, to um, basically create a, a spreadsheet or a, a list that enabled us to capture some of this kind of key data, which is firstly the assessor name to make sure that we were able to trace back and see who it was that had collected the data. Um, for, for a specific venue and I'll go into a little bit later where we went and the scope and scale of the study. Um, we also for um, the snakes that we were assessing recorded the vendor ID number so the, the, the name of the, um, the stall or the, the, the company that was, that was um, showing or selling the snakes which we anonymized. Um, this wasn't about in this particular case um, naming shaming it was just for us to be able to tell the number of different vendors that were present at the facility uh, we also tried to, to a top level to try and capture the, the number of ball pythons that were being sold by each vendor uh, as much as possible and it was extremely difficult given the vast majority of different uh, morphs or color types it was really to try and get a feel for wild type versus color morphs um, um, also to to record the number of enclosures so the number of specific um, containers for lack of a better phrase where the snakes were being displayed, the number of snakes um, relating to the kind of co-having issue in terms of each enclosure and also the time of observation. So just some kind of background basic um, um, information really that really enabled us to, um, to, uh, to, to kind of refer back and um, compare notes. Um, so what this enabled us to do um, from there was to to really start creating some of these these scoring and assessment criteria um, the first one that we we landed on was we thought it was really important to try and capture the amount of space and the mobility that the animal was being provided uh, and we basically broke this down into three um, three levels three scores the the animal could either get a one if the length of the enclosure was was less than the length of the snake uh, the lowest score possible it got a score of two if the length of the enclosure was the length of the snake so it means the snake could stretch out um, but it was relatively little movement beyond that and we gave it the highest welfare score um, or you know the thumbs up basically if the length of the enclosure was approximately one and a half times the length of the snake so there is that ability to to stretch out and to move um, um, to at least some degree um, let's see if this slide comes up um, and if I can give you an example here, um, you know, here's, here's an example where, um, you know, you would be looking at the lowest score. Um, you know, the animals clearly are, aren't able to, um, to move properly or to stretch out. And um, as we'll see later, this was all too common, unfortunately, a, um, an observation that we saw at the pet um, expositions. The other criteria that we felt uh, was very useful and important to follow up on was um, shelter. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think um, you know, these are um, animals that don't particularly like to be active during the day. And so when you do find yourself in a noisy, busy uh, pet exposition that will typically have um, a lot of bright lighting, um, it is important that the animal has the ability to, to find shelter and to um, um, to basically secure itself away um, from from you know the, the harsh lights etc. 
So um, what we decided again was to, to, to have a three tiered scoring system, one being no shelter present whatsoever. The second being that there was a shelter, but it didn't enable this snake to kind of be 100% uh, covered when it, when it was coiled. And the highest welfare score was that there was a shelter present and enabled 100% um, of the coiled snake to, to be able to, to fit underneath. Um, and um, I think I've got an example here of, so as you can see in this instance, uh, there is an attempt to give shelter, but um, you know, it's, it's a far cry from actually being useful, um, for lack of a better phrase, in, in that regard. So um, yeah, so we've got our shelter covered and we've got our ability. Uh, the other one that we felt was important and was possible to score in a kind of a quick, a quick um, run through of an exotic pet expo was water. So again, the common theme being the three tier system. One, that there was no water present, no choice, no ability to drink, no ability to, um, to, to bathe or, or to, to clean themselves. Two, the water was, was present, but it was too small for the snake to fully submerge. And um, three, that their water um, was present and it did enable the snake to, um, to fully submerge and to, to clean itself. Uh, again, here is, um, here is an example, again, where you've got uh, water has been provided, but there is no way uh, that that snake is physically um, going to be able to use that water source in a, in a, in a useful, meaningful way uh, in terms of, of cleaning. Um, um, the next one that we used was um, substrate. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot out there in the literature in terms of the best substrate to use. You've heard a lot about wood and some of the problems that can be associated there, but also um, in some cases, um, paper newspaper is criticised for not being absorbent enough. So um, we felt in this case the the most useful thing actually wasn't to focus so much on the substrate um, type itself. Uh, but rather in this instance just to see whether any was present and if it was present what to what degree of the floor was covered so again the three-tier system one no substrate was was present zero percent um, two that there was some present but it covered less than 75 percent of the floor and for the third that it was present um, but it covered more than 75 percent of the um, of the enclosure floor Um, again, here's another another example of a, of a you know um, uh, a situation where um, this would have um, you know scored very poorly on the on the scale. There is um, substrate there in the form of this kind of wet rag, but it's completely soaked through and it's and it's not covering seventy five percent of the uh, um, of the enclosure floor. Uh, and lastly, the um, the other criteria that we used. Hygiene, um, again, the three-tier score, one, the lowest score would be the detritus was liberally present, um, droppings, etc. cetera. Um, two, um, we, we here went for a, a kind of a, a two and three between, um, with three being that detritus was minimal or absent. So maybe the animal had, had uh, defecated once very recently and it was very clear that um, you know, it hadn't been there for a long time. So, um, we thought that this was a was a useful scoring system to um to apply uh, and here's an example here where again you've got um, a very clean uh, and hygienic um, enclosure um, so this would have scored a three but as you can see in terms of mobility this this uh, this photo really does kind of highlight the challenges with a snake that is desperately trying to stretch out to its full length um, but not, not not really quite able to do so and, and how it's going about trying to to rectify that so um, a quick insight into how this was applied and um, what we found um, as I mentioned earlier I think this is this does appear to be the largest um, study of its kind in terms of the fact that we went to um, uh, exotic pet expos, um, you know, in, in multiple regions. We visited them in the USA, in Canada, in Spain, the Netherlands, and the UK. Um, and in total, you know, nearly five thousand snakes were were scored using the criteria that I just outlined. And um, what we found was that this um, this really translated um, into some quite 
quite um, quite disturbing results. I mean, here's a here's a graph um, that really hopefully summarizes a lot of what we found. Um, here you've got the um, along the bottom. Um, you've got the environmental assessment categories that I just ran through: hygiene, mobility, shelter, substrate, and water. You've got the three um, tiers. So red is the lowest welfare score they could have got um, of the one. Amber is the medium, so that, that that kind of two score, and green is the the highest um, kind of score they could have got. Um, and as you can see, essentially, um, hygiene they scored really well. I mean, the the enclosures were clean. Um, we presume that's because um, there is a benefit to having a clean and, and shiny enclosure when you're displaying an animal that you are, are, are looking to sell. But as you can see, other than that, it really starts to drop down quite quickly, um, which is I mean, maybe just jumping to this uh, fourth column, the substrate one, you can see where um, there is, there is a, a higher degree there of, um, um, of um, kind of amber, where um, there was substrate that covered some, you know, um, less than seventy-five percent of the um, of the enclosure floor, but it was there. But um, but really speaking, I guess the key findings from this graph and the key takeaway points is just to highlight in terms of mobility, shelter, and water. Um, you're looking at the lowest scores possible. Um, the animals aren't, you know, highly restricted and and aren't able to move in a way that would, um, you know, be be a positive animal welfare state. No shelters were provided, so there was that real, you know, really removal of that ability to um, to find to, to to hide away from from negative experiences that they're going through, and also just a lack of water um, um, during these um, during these facilities. Um, so, of course, one criticism of this could be, well, this is a pet expo; uh, it's a very short period of time, and um, you know, it's 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 just a temporary um, situation, um, and it's not it's not standard practice. Um, one thing we definitely observed from from you know, I don't know how many of, of the consumers would go to the same expo multiple days in a row, which which is a you know a common occurrence for some of these these events. But we did as part of this. And one thing became clear is that it's it's common practice, I would say where um, just a sheet will be put over you know the animals won't be moved from the, the, the venue um, and then taken back the following day so there is an element of just a kind of a, a cloth being thrown over them so in short it, it's not just a couple of hours it can be a couple of days where the animals are in those conditions depending on the length of the exposition but but equally you know bearing this in mind we did also want to look at some of these racking systems that you've seen earlier so these these rooms that are just full of drawers of of snakes that are being are being kind of um, you know bred in on mass to 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 meet consumer demand and this graph basically shows you um, the results that we found from online so we we actually went onto YouTube and we found um, uh, I think in, in total we found um, 113 venue um, different videos um, of of vendors and and breeders that had, had kind of posted up videos of you know kind of this is my facility come and look at it and and to really show off show off their wares um and um of that we were able to score uh, an extra uh, additional 787 ball pythons and so what you can see here again um, um looking at these videos and using exactly the same scoring criteria hygiene is is quite high substrate is, is generally better i think that's the main difference um in many cases there was for water this amber last column there was more water present but um again it was of a, a quantity and amount that enables the snakes to drink rather than to bathe um but i guess in terms of long-term welfare and you've got to remember that in many cases these snakes will be kept in these racking systems for years potentially if not decades um you know you've got really you know the poor welfare scores again the lowest possible here for mobility the snakes aren't able to stretch out probably is an element there of 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 money saving the more you can fit into that racking system the more potential there is for profit and again you know a real real lack of shelter um again one could argue that the drawer itself that they kept in is, is a shelter but um in some cases these there were more than one snake kept in the drawer so again it's it's really um, not optimum um in terms of, of the welfare and hence the the low score that was provided um, Another thing that we that I, I think is 
quite interesting and relevant to share was that um, from these YouTube videos, we actually um, set about looking at the top 10 comments for each of these, these 100 plus videos. And we, we um, basically copied and pasted the, the, the comments that were left. And we tried to remove as much as possible, you know, the, the redundant words such as the and, you know, they and, and what we've tried to do is to, to really analyze the words that were left. So bearing in mind that, they, you know, they weren't really getting um, a shining, um, you know, you know, kind of report in terms of the welfare scores. Um, it was really quite interesting to see um, that in many cases, the vast majority of the um, of the the phrases that were that were put down um, were really positive in nature. Um, so as you can see, thanks, great, good, love, awesome, snake. Um, so again, what it what it really raises concerns is that um, you know it's at least some, if not many, of the potential consumers of bull pythons as exotic pets you know, probably aren't able to really recognize unsuitable housing conditions that don't meet those kind of minimum animal welfare standards that we talked about. So again, it comes back to what's been discussed a lot today already, but it, it leads consumers potentially to buy animals without really fully understanding the complex needs that they have and, um, and the requirements and the commitment that's needed from them as a, as a responsible owner. So um, again, I thought it was useful to, to share. Um, so really coming to a point just to, to round up but um you know just to highlight the really the limitations of 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 this approach um you know this this is um it, you know, our assessment really was um restricted to a particular set of housing criteria that i outlined and it didn't involve direct handling it didn't involve physical examinations or behavioral observations and so they are very much a proxy for animal welfare, and it's this environmental assessment conditions uh, um, that we that we worked with here, um, and and also just to just to jump back a little bit, um, you know, it's important to recognise that animal husbandry guidance is ever evolving and varied, and we're increasingly learning. But um, it just goes to show how much, um, even where there is limited available data out there, you can um, use the existing information if you go to responsible, you know. Um, verified sources you can use this to build up a useful uh, useful scoring criteria um, but um you know despite those limitations really just to finish off um, you know it, it hopefully it does serve as an example where um, you know it shows that with, with very little um, equipment um, and and um, when you haven't got the access to a veterinarian when you haven't got the access to to the equipment you still can do, you know, as in this case, which is the largest, most in-depth review of environmental conditions for bull pythons at Exposed and, 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 and by breeders at home that we think has been carried out um, so far, you know, you can um, carry out very useful studies that, that um, summarise information that can be useful, that, that you can um, publish, which is, is, is the case here, and which can then be presented and, and to a range of different stakeholders, be it authorities, um, enforcement officials, um, other NGOs, the general public, um, and just to highlight, this is a this is a, and what I hope that, that that can be done is that this kind of approach can be adapted for other species in other captive scenarios. So, for example, we've used a similar approach to um, SSC turtles in the Caribbean, in in, in captive scenarios, um, elephants, macaques, tigers uh, in in Asia, civets um, involved in the civet coffee industry in in cages in in, in Asia. So. Um, yeah, hoping that this really can stimulate new research um, and, and hopefully focus in a way that can can be used to inform. And it might be anything from husbandry guidelines to to policy improvements, consumer awareness initiatives, making people realise that um, the, the challenges and the difficulties um, associated with, with with exotic pet ownership. Um, and yeah, I guess all that's left to do is say thank you again for your your time and your interest. Um, and um, yeah, I've just left up the, the reference here. If you did want to read the, the full paper and see the methods, et cetera, in there, um, here's, the, um, here's the full reference. So um, yeah, thanks again. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. DeCruz. That was a fascinating presentation. And uh, we've got a few questions, but one from, for, that I'd like to pose to you 
first is uh, a lot of uh, people in the humane movement have talked about uh, regulation of reptile expos and exotic pet expos. Uh, because you talked about, about snakes and reptiles, uh, my question to you is, um, if you were to regulate uh, these expos so that animal welfare is um, a real consideration, what kinds of things, and I'm not asking you to come up on the spot with the whole regulatory scheme, but what kinds of sure. things would you see if these businesses were to continue doing these things with these animals? What, what would a good regulatory uh, program look like? Or what are even some facets uh, of what, you know, what might happen? Um, in short, I think if it was, it, to, be, to be honest, I think it was, if it was really truly applied in a scientific manner, in a responsible manner, and in an effective manner, it would mean less species diversity, it would mean less animals, and you know, that I'm sure would mean less profits. So, so yeah, I think, I think you know, um, regular, it, it's an industry that exists. We can't, we can't ignore that and regulation is key, but equally I think we should recognize increasingly the conservation, the public health, the animal welfare, scientific evidence and, and concerns that are raised increasingly raise questions about whether or not this is something that we should be regulating and you know allowing to continue to flourish and boom in the way that it has as we've heard it's gone from small scale 1940s 1950s gradually increasing in the 90s it, it, it becomes huge and now um, you know the concerns are rising so um, in short, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, as the bull python is a case, case point in study, minimum standards, giving the animal the ability to stretch its, but it's, it's full length. Um, you're talking about an increase in enclosure size, which, which brings a whole wealth of, um, of challenges for the industry. You know, even if you discount everything else, just challenges the industry to be able to, to translate that into enclosures from, you know, from where the animal is kept in the home and, and bred to transport to being sold. And so, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a major, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I think there's no, no short, quick fix, but it's, it's something that we definitely need to be, um, be bearing in mind with, uh, with these types of, of phenomenon. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question that, that I received that someone wanted me to ask uh, of you is the, this person was particularly baffled by the way these animals are kept in, in expos and, and even you know in breeding facilities and elsewhere. And, and their major concern was that they're kept in very Spartan tiny containers, which many you showed many of those images. And they wondered why uh, this type of keeping is so ubiquitous when many of the people presumably uh, may go out field herping and seeing these animals in the wild or be reading about them or watching and would have some knowledge of how their natural lives are. Why do you think this style of keeping is so ubiquitous? Um, I think um, there's, there's several components to it, but some of the main ones that jump to mind. First of all, there is, of course, this difference between surviving and thriving. So just, you know, I think bull pythons, uh, one of the key things is that they're a robust species, right? They're able to, to cope with that lack of en enrichment and without, um, for example, like a chameleon where it may not, may not make it, um, um, you know, may not physically survive long with, with inadequate conditions. Um, but yeah, again, I think, I think in the case of, 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 of herpers or, or, or those that do know, do know snakes, again, there may be the, um, you know, potentially the misconception that this is a species that spends a lot of its time in a burrow. But again, without realizing that there's, there's still that element of choice. The animal doesn't, it's, you know, the comparison would be a bear maybe that maybe more, more of the listeners here are, are more familiar with. A bear will hibernate, but a bear doesn't just hibernate. You can't take that snapshot of a period of time of its life history and then apply it to its full life history. And I think there's an element of that. It's a, it's, again, I think it's genuinely in, in most cases coming from a, from an affinity for the animals, for that desire to be close to them, but it's 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 focusing on the parts of their natural history or life history that are that that enable that cognitive dissonance, dissonance that ability to to um, to you know 
basically enable enable them to to justify why the animal is is kept in, and not see see the um, potentially the long term issues that are associated with it. Well, that's a very good segue into the next question. Um, and that question is, uh, in your work dealing with these issues, exotic pets, uh, have you found any receptiveness on the part of people that are, whether they're keepers or breeders or other industry members, to actually rethinking what they're doing and, and to changing, you know, or, or have they just put up walls and become very defensive? No, no, not at all. I think, you know, you get a range of, of reactions. Some, 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 um, you know, very, um, you know, walls come down and, um, and you're not able to really have the kind of discussion that you would, you would like. But in other cases, you know, really, really positive um, discussions on, on both sides. And one, for example, one, um, one recent conversation, which really, um, you know, you know, kind of, kind of made my day was, you know the acknowledgement that, um, as was been talked to some of the the, um, the other by some of the other speakers earlier, there's a lot of snakes that are all you know, again using snakes as the arm example. There's a lot of snakes that are just caught in the system now that need homes. You know, if you do have that child that really is that, in, you know, and I completely understand it. I mean, I've got a PhD in herpetology. I can understand why people have the affinity for these animals and want to be close and study them. But you know, there's a lot of rescue animals out there at the moment that need that would really benefit from that kind of, of enthusiasm and the huge tank that would come with it. You know, it's, it's, it's at the moment just mopping up some of the problems that are caused by this mass boom that's happened. Um, you know, that's, that's somewhere that, 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 that energy and that positivity can be focused, but to breed more animals at the rate that we're going with the, with the negative um, after effects in the case of the you know, impacts of the bull python, where you have these, you know, it's almost like, uh, the example I give is, you know, kind of in a in a laboratory where they're doing Mendelian um, Mendelian genetics to get the um, the fruit flies to get the right icons and just euthanizing those that are left. So it's it's got to that point where we're treating this with a with an animal that is sentient that can feel um, emotions as, as as I discussed earlier. So so yeah, I think there's 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 positive um, interactions um, that are that that we we can build on and we can hopefully move in the right direction. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, so I'll just uh, give you one more question that I've received, and that is, uh, um, you have a PhD in, in herpetology and have focused this particular uh, effort on ball pythons, but in the course of visiting these pet expos, have you encountered other kinds of animals, and how do their conditions, spatially and otherwise, compared to those experienced by reptiles? And I, I assume they're meaning, you know, not specifically, but sort of generally, how do they, how do they compare? Um, from the, the pet expeditions I've been to, um, as, as opposed to kind of the wildlife trade markets, um, you know, I think um, I've been, I, I think definitely reptiles and amphibians, generally speaking, get, get the worst the worst deal um you know that's where you really see the animals in in tiny little yogurt pots ice cream tubs um you know plastic containers really where they are kind of displayed as as sweets at a candy store you know with with no no space to move no substrate no water no enrichment um um and um and yeah i think generally speaking when you do see from from the expos i've been to um, you know, there does seem to be a little bit more um, understanding when it comes to mammals in terms of what they might require. Um, but again, far short um, of, of, of what would be required in most instances. But um, in short, I would say, I would say reptiles and amphibians definitely, um, definitely are, are probably suffering to the degree of this lack of understanding that they are, they are also sentient just because their biology is so different to what, you know, and how they express pain, fear, and suffering is so different to what, to, to how a mammal would. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. I'm sure everybody found it as illuminating as I did. Uh, we're now uh, out of time. I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar session, and we hope to see you at next week's session, which is taking place on October 21st. And in that session, we're going to be exploring ideas about the actual regulation of exotic pets, and we're going to look at the human health issues that are associated 
with exotic pets. If this is your last registered session, please take a minute and fill out uh, our post event survey. It's going to be really helpful. This feedback is very valuable for us. And uh, you'll be receiving, if you haven't already, a link to the post event survey. And finally, I just wanted to tell people that uh, we will be releasing uh, a number of resources for enforcement people and policymakers in early November once this webinar series is over. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week.